Welcome to Order 42. I am Rob, and today, you know him, you love him. We're hanging out with our old buddy, Bucho. What is going on, sir? Bucho in the hizzy, Robbie. <laughs> the fancy merch on and everything. Look at that. Thanks to the eagle himself. That's right. And he is here. Eagle and Vicky are in the house. <laughs> Good day to the Eagle and Vicky. Yeah. So, gosh, guys, welcome. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, it's it's always fun having Bucho on. He's, I mean, shit, you, you've been like, you've been a longtime supporter of me for some reason. And uh, I've always appreciated it. But, you know, turns out it's always fun having, on, having you on here because we can just chat and have a good time. And it's fun. We can so, use our mouths and ears instead of chit-chatting on Discord like we do most of the time. Right, right. Now... We can use our voice boxes. <laughs> it's funny, he said good-looking shirt. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, but uh, just, guys, let me know. Because of my weird Big Sur issue, I had to reinstall a bunch of things. and And that's why we were a tad late getting on today because my audio wasn't working and it's because I had to reinstall Catalina from Big Sur so yeah just to you know if anybody's streaming on Mac do not upgrade to, to Big Sur yet because OBS does not work at all it won't even open so anyway um, before we get started like into the movie stuff and the what we've been watching and whatever the heck how have you been, man? I haven't talked to you like kind of face to face in a, in a while. Oh uh, yeah, man, we're fine. I mean, every time I'm on or every time I chat with you, I just talk about how I constantly feel like I'm in, lucky to be in one of the most fortunate places on the planet. You know, we've we've basically got life at no, life as normal. You know, we have these little outbreaks here and there, but the system that um is put in place by uh by uh you know the people in charge keep seem seem to be able to keep snuffing out any sort of outbreaks we've had so it's really uh i mean is it australia australia's got this nickname the lucky country is one of the nicknames but you know we're here we've had no real meaningful um lockdowns for well over a month and um was it maybe even two months now? I don't know. That, the fun, weird thing about this year is, and this is partly just getting old as well, time and time is so hard to judge. And I've always been bad at judging how long ago things happened anyway. But this weird year has made it even more so. But long story short, it's uh, New Zealand's a pretty good place to be right now. So, yeah, I've been good there. No so how many movies have you filmed in the last seven months? <laughs> Yeah, not, I haven't nah, filmed any personally, but apparently if you're in that industry here, you're going pretty good. Yeah, yeah. No, I've been Cowboy and Bebops of, and Avatars and uh, all that yeah. other stuff you've been mentioning on your episodes, your news episodes. Yeah, and it's it's weird too because like, for some reason I always want to ask you, but then I have to remember, New Zealand isn't like, you know, six blocks long and, you know, you know everybody just because they say the word the words New Zealand doesn't mean that, you know, they're filming. Hey, I was watching uh, you know, watching them film across the street the other day and you know, it's it's just one of those things I have to keep reminding myself cuz I'm an idiot apparently. But yeah. Um now yeah, a lot of be- that stuff happens down cut. There is it's really Auckland is where they shoot the TV shows like when they used to do Xena and Hercules and that Rob um Tappet stuff that was all shot in basically in West Auckland, but movies are generally sh- the movie central is Wellywood or Wellington. And that's uh, where Peter Jackson is. And that's, so that's in the, basically at the bottom of the North Island. So in the middle of the country and uh, that's also our capital. And uh, of course, and the South Island is, is really where all the, if you want to do um, epic nature footage, I mean, the North Island's got a lot of beauty as well. And that's where I am, of course. So, I'm a bit biased toward it, but the, the South Island is where the magic happens mostly when you, if you want to shoot those uh, beautiful um, natural nature scapes. 
But I mean, a lot of the movies that are being shot here are very, there's not a lot of nature being shot. You know, it's Avatar, Cowboy Bebop, I'm sure is a lot of uh, either green screen or maybe they're using that Mandalorian wraparound fancy pants technology. I don't know what, what they're doing, but um, yeah, I think a lot of what's being shot here is more sci-fi. And so it's just that we have an infrastructure, a, uh, a cinema a production infrastructure that's that's working well at the moment. Well, that's that's awesome. And I mean, you've been you've been back at work for gosh a a, a while, right? I mean, they they you locked down just yeah. like pretty much everybody, but then you were able you guys were able to open up a lot faster than anyone else. Yeah, and it's, it's they're, they're sort of target certain industries, and because I'm in construction and we work outside a lot, and it's easy to distance. We were allowed to go back to work before other industries were, who have to work indoors and in close proximity and what have you. Although a lot of, even a lot of those people are working from home. So uh, we've managed to keep things ticking pretty well. The main hit that we're taking, of course, is tourism. Tourism is massive for New Zealand. Yeah, because of the aforementioned fancy pants nature that we have here. And it's uh, just a place a lot of people like to come on holiday if they can. You know, so we're a long way from everywhere else. We're the most geographically isolated plan, uh, country on the world. But um, yeah, a lot. I think it's a, maybe even up to 20% sounds high, but it might even be that 20% of our GDP pre-COVID came from uh, tourism. So our wow. a big economic hit. Is it 12% or 20%? I should know more about this stuff, but it's, pretty, it's big anyway. It's the major hit for us. Uh, but other things like our primary sector uh, has been going you know we make a lot of food here we're we're a pretty agricultural sort of country is in a lot of ways so uh some some of our sectors have been cranking really nicely uh but yeah i've been at work pretty constantly even when our second lockdown happened we only went to level two out we've got a system here where level one is where we are now which is almost normal you still do track and trace and what have you. And then level two, there's a certain amount of people who are told to stay at home, but they keep schools open, what have you. And so level three, level four, and level four is hardcore lockdown. We haven't been there for four or five months now, is it? Like yeah. I said, I'm bad at tracking the time, but life for me has been pretty normal for at least three or four months. So mm. yeah, like I say, very fortunate to be where I am. Yeah. So when are you coming over? Uh, I booked my You're ticket. in the movie industry now, so <laughs> you should be able to start applying for jobs over here. And hey, you know, are you we can always me? use I people would... with April's set of skills. She's obviously very highly qualified and, and talented. Oh, so, I would uh... love it. I mean, are you kidding me? I would, I would love it. It's, it's so strange too because, like, you know, like Monday we we went and shot our little thing for the for those of you who hadn't been paying attention to the game chaser stuff. Um, a little update was that um, the yeah, they, we we did some pickup shots and and I would say not really reshoots, more pickup shots on Monday, and uh, and yeah, I got to tell you, man, it was it was like we'd never left the set. It was awesome and it was fun and it was uh, it was weird because like the days up to it, you know, because of my you know condition, immunosuppressed and all that mess. I was just like, I I was so nervous and was like, okay, I got to make sure I socially distance. I should, I got to make sure I, I mean, of course I got my mask and all that kind of stuff, man, we had a blast and it was so awesome seeing everybody talk with her. It's like, I didn't realize how much I'd missed them. I mean, even Billy and Jay, who've been on this show, you know, a lot, I still was like, it was awesome to actually see them and interact with them. And it was just, it was so much fun. And we got we got a lot of good shots too, so that's good. But yeah, I mean, dude, are you kidding me? I would of course love hey, Game Chasers movie two. Let's shoot in New Zealand. I mean, I don't that, that'll probably never happen. We micro budget type stuff, but are you kidding me? I would love that. It would be so awesome. Well, we'll see how well the first Game Chasers does, and you know, when it becomes a gargantuan hit. You know, maybe they got to come over and do some do some work down at Widow or something. Oh, dude, it would be yeah, yeah, that would be that would be amazing. <laughs> but 
I don't know, man. I I just uh, I envy you, not just because that you're you know you're not locked down or you're not as locked down as as we are, but man, you, I mean, you do live in a beautiful country, and you probably take it for granted. Just like you know when you when you when you see things about Texas, you're like you're like oh man, I'd love to. I'd love to experience that. I'd love to have this and that or whatever. We take it for granted because we're around it. You know, we, you know, barbecue is just, yeah, we can, I can go down the street and get barbecue right now, you know, but it's not something everybody can get or everybody can experience. So I totally get it. <laughs> Eagle Ford said, do you have an extra room? Hey. Well, you know, it is coming into summer, so we don't, have a uh, we won't have a spare room when uh robbie and april are staying with us but we will be able to uh, put a tent out you know in the yard because it'll be summertime and uh you know nice weather oh. we can stand a tent for well, we'll we'll put robbie and april out in the tent of course if eagleford and vicky come over because uh, they'll be uh they'll have seniority of rank won't they well yeah and i think that would be the a family uh, trip yeah that would be the 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 hierarchy for sure you know they get the comfy stuff but but yeah, uh, oh man, it's, and it's one of those things where, you know, I'm, sh- I'm sure you, you know, that's how you feel. And I guarantee you, you ever come to Texas, you know, you got a place to stay, you know? I mean, seriously, it's like, come on, it'd be awesome. It would be, it would be so great. Um, yeah, man, I've always had a soft spot for Texas. I was there ever, ever since I was a kid, I was a big Stevie Ray Vaughan fan. I know he's from Austin and I'm from DFW, but you know, Wes Anderson, one of my favorite filmmakers from Texas. My nickname Bucho comes from a Robert Rodriguez movie. He's a Texas guy. One of my favorite bands is the Mars Volta. They're from El Paso. Like for some reason, I mean, you guys are massive. So a lot of cool stuff comes out of massive oh, yeah. places. So yeah, have always had a soft spot for Texas. And Hey, now we can put order 42 on the list of amazing things out of t- <laughs> Yep. Let's let's just. Pat Billy's now one of my that. favorite filmmakers, even though I've never seen any of his movies yet. Who's that? Billy. He's oh, he's yeah. from Texas, and I I haven't seen any of his movies yet, but he's my second favorite, Texas third favorite. He's in my top three with uh, Robert Rodriguez and uh, Oh, there you go. Anderson now. There you go. Well, I and you know, I have mentioned that I have been because of my position on the movie that keeps changing i keep doing all kinds of stuff i mean it's like you know i started off helping just with locations a little bit of casting help you know then now i was then i was script supervisor during production then i was helping with sound editing and and then uh, i guess you can add second unit director I guess you could say since on Monday, you know, a lot of the, that was the, what the, the really fun thing. It was not only was I able to interact with everybody, but got to, uh, you know, come up with stuff, you know, come up with shots and just say, Hey, let's try this. Let's do this. You know, okay. You come from over here, stand here. And then, you know, all this, I mean, it was, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. It was also, so who's, who's working the camera on the second? We had, uh, we had, so Peter was there. Um, oh, he was there. Oh, that's what, because I was. Uh, I thought I didn't, for some reason, assume he wasn't there. But that's cool, man. And it's awesome that he made it back. Yeah. So really, the the only person from the original production, as far as crew goes, would be Peter. Um, Renee was also there, and Renee um, hasn't been shown a whole lot, but he is one of the. Uh, he was basically doing some. I would say behind the scenes stuff. That's what he was there to do. He would some days he would just be there all day and he would just be shooting random things, talking with people. And it was just stuff that that Billy might use on um, like the Patreon updates or or stuff like that or any behind the scenes stuff. In fact, uh, a lot of the footage from this. In fact, here, um, I'll just put this in chat real fast if my keyboard would work. Exclamation Park update brings you the link to the the recent game chasers video where billy kind of explains where the movie is in the progress and also the progress on all the upcoming blu-rays that they're putting out for the seasons of the game chasers so it's kind of cool because you see a lot of the behind the scenes stuff and you know there's a quite a bit of me in there um 
but it's it was interesting to hear from his point of view you know where he believes the movie is you know because i know that you know rough cut's been done i've been able to watch a lot of it there's a lot of there's still all those little connecting pieces that have to be done um cg still has to be finished a lot of the like and then once all once all that's in there and the editing gets tightened up, then we can do the final sound mix, which I think uh, Joe from GameSack will be doing that. Um, so I mean, there's 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 still a lot of work to be done, but I think we're in a really good place. I really have enjoyed watching because you know if you if you've ever done a movie, if you've ever written anything, what happens is you write it. You get, you know, you maybe there's jokes or whatever. Sometimes the jokes work on paper and they don't work live. And sometimes it's the other way around. You go, man, that sounds really cheesy on the page, and it works really, really well when it's when it's filmed. With this, there were a lot of things that he created in editing. Moments that I didn't know it wasn't in the script. It was something that he created through the editing process, and it's some of the stuff is hilarious. Like there's one moment that I can't go into, but it's there's one moment where I was just I just like I had to stop and I was just like I can't that was awesome. I loved how you did that and it was a simple little thing. And then, you know, also knowing because I was script supervisor, that meant I had the monitor basically in my face for every shot, you know, that we filmed. I'm sitting there watching the stuff I'm trying to watch for continuity errors, things like that, but I'm also timing the shots, all that kind of stuff. So I'm really locked in and paying attention. And it's weird because I almost have a mental log of all the shots, the different shots, and I can tell sometimes when he uses multiple different takes. Sometimes I can't. I don't remember everything. But it's kind of cool that there's times when he's used takes that that they don't, like camera angle camera angle camera angle and then the the second time he cuts over to somebody it's a different take or it's a different or it's a mess up but it's it's done in a way that makes it work within the story telling the story it's I, that's that's one of the coolest things about editing is that you can really you can make a movie you can make a movie terrible of course in editing but you can also make a movie even better than what you thought i'm going off yeah. on this tangent and i didn't mean to i have been <laughs> Yeah, no, I haven't seen the the new the new update yet. I know that you mentioned it on your latest Castlevania stream, which uh, I've been I've watched about half of the replay, or maybe the first third of that replay. When I say watched, I generally and I mean I know you know this, but just for the just for the viewers, I tend to put on those as background uh, sound. So I your um Castlevania is uh, almost Castlevania runs almost like a podcast for me. I'll put it on if I'm doing a work here in the office, um, working on other stuff, but and partly uh, it's good because uh, you drop in little pieces of news and little updates on what's going on in your world, but also uh, the music in Castlevania is awesome. So yeah, <laughs> it's just right. fun to listen to. And I, I love that soundtrack now. I have to try and get hold of it, but uh, it's such a fun soundtrack. Yeah. Castlevania. And I think, you? I think what I want to do is because of course next week we've got the, the new Hyrule warriors that I want to, at least try on stream. Look, the the problem is I get so when it's something new and I don't know what I'm doing, I'm like trying to pay attention to what the hell's going on, which means I'm just sitting there, which is not probably an entertaining stream unless you're just really locked into the game, in which case I guess it's okay. But like, I, I don't feel like I'm being very entertaining because I don't know what I'm doing. You know, you, does that make any yeah, sense? Yeah, I know what you're saying, but I think as long as I mean, this is for every streamer who plays a brand new game, right? Which is a, which is a big thing on Twitch. You know, everyone plays a new game sometimes. So yeah. as long as you give commentary on what you're doing, including the parts where you don't know what you're doing, that's all part of the fun, right? Well, and I think I think another thing too is that like when uh, when I played the demo, I was sitting there and I'm like, I want to. I want to interact with the chat because they were they were asking questions or they were talking or whatever. And I want to interact with that, but then I I got to pay attention to what the game is telling me so I know how to play the game because the, there's little things and, and it's just like it's 
And maybe I'm just not good at that part of it, you know, when I'm playing a new game. That's part of the reason why I was playing Ari of Sorrow is because I know that game. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to figure out how to play it. I know how to play it, you know? So it's, yeah. I can focus on attempting to be entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Well, the other thing that's great about it, listening to it as a podcast is you drop, <laughs> you drop in the accents. That's one of the fun. You did it again in the most recent one when the, no spoilers, but same as Flying Sound, same as Dracula. That part when you know you always <laughs> to the, uh, talking to the uh, other characters and we've got voices, and then Soma turns into Keanu Reeves, or Keanu Reeves voice, and what have you. I, just I, like, I I'm just trying to. Yeah, it's I I, I enjoy that stuff, and it's like I want to play the. Uh, um. But anyway, I was I was saying, yeah, the Hyrule Warriors, I want to play that. I want to at least try it on stream and see how it works. But then I want to play Super Castlevania 4, which is one of my favorites. And talk about a great soundtrack, man. That one, that is like the best soundtrack. But there's no story, really. It's literally just level, level, level. You know what I mean? There's no, there's not a lot to it. You just play right. through it. But I think it'd be fun to play just because the soundtrack's awesome and I enjoy the game, but anyway, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a thing and I just, I got to get better at, at doing that, you know, trying to get what I'm getting from the game so I can play the game at least halfway decent, but then also, I don't know, it's, a, it's a balance and I just got to figure that I got to, I got to find that balance. So, yeah, man, just keep doing it. Oh, it's fun. You better at stuff, right? It is so much fun, and I just, I just hope people enjoy it. You know. Now, let me ask you this. This is something that I was curious about. You had said that you had made it to the theater a couple of times, right? Yes. Back to you know when you know, of course, you guys opened up probably earlier than anyone else when it came to theaters. But did you like how many how many times have you been? Has it been like a normal thing going back every now and then, or is it? You know, ah, oh, I went back once and I've been busy. I don't know. You tell me. Yeah, one of the things that you and I have in common is that both of us have wives who are um, very busy and are actually doing university degrees. Although uh, I think April was finished hers yet. I don't know. How, I can't remember uh, if you put that out there. Maybe I shouldn't be talking about that, but my wife is um, doing a degree and so she's super busy and so we don't get to. Uh, go out to the movies or go out and do stuff as often as we would normally but um so i've still only been twice and actually one of those times wasn't with Rita. so we've only actually been on one hot movie date in the last uh bunch of months even though we are cinemas are open you know so that's right. something i need to take more advantage of you know get get the nephews out and get along there with other people because i still haven't seen tenet you know i've seen um Rhea and i went and saw I think we talked about this last time. What is it? The King of Staten Island, which is mm. a Judd Apatow film about Pete Davidson, you know, starring Bill Burr. And, um, the other thing I've seen is Greenland, which is a dumb but but fun uh, asteroid smashing the Earth movie, you know. So, but yeah, I haven't been getting out there enough uh, to, to go to the actual cinema and support the industry. Um, partly, like Gerard I said, because Butler, my right? wife is super busy. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. I was I went blank there for a second. I was like Greenland. Gerard but, yeah. Butler. Now, well, and part of the reason why I asked you that for a couple of reasons because number one, I'm I'm interested to see how many times you'd been because I haven't been since I can't even remember the first, the last movie I saw in the theater. But also that I was hoping that you would have said, "Yeah, I saw a Tenet." <laughs> because here's here's why. I should have there's recently, I think it was yesterday or the day before he did an interview where he had said that a couple of his movie maker friends also called him up and called him out on his sound mixing. It's like the, you know, the fact that you can't understand what the heck's going on. And it's like, I guess, have you had that problem with Christopher Nolan movies in the past? The first time I remember there being conversation about it was after Dunkirk. I don't think 
I mean, uh, I haven't caught up with that story. I saw the headline and I saw a little bit of chit chat about it, but I haven't read um, the conversation or what these other filmmakers filmmakers have said. I saw that Nolan had a reply along the lines of saying that he was surprised that other filmmakers were conservative about their yeah. um, sound views, and uh, some of my some of my online chat buddies are talking about how Nolan is a bit. He sort of has a punk rock um, view on sound where it's like a full body experience. I don't know. I'm talking a little bit out of my jacks here because like I said, I haven't read what he said. The, the, I mean, Dunkirk, I don't think I had a problem with what I know that a lot of my American friends maybe had more of a problem because they're not as used to listening to British accents combined with maybe a sound mix that is less traditional, you know? So um, I have never had a problem with it myself watching a Nolan film. Mm. Well, I was but, yeah I know it's a thing yeah and like the only one that I can remember because here's the thing I didn't see Dunkirk in the theater so the first time I saw it I was at home I always have subtitles on just because right. I like subtitles I don't I don't know if that's a it, it feels like it's become the norm a lot of people do that um, but I always have the subtitles on but I remember when we were watching The Dark Knight Rises I couldn't understand what the hell Bane was saying. Like never like the whole time I'm like, okay, I kind of I caught that. But for the most part, I didn't understand what he was saying. And it's because everything was like this. So you know, you, you know and you're like it's it's so weird. So it's like I wonder if I'm wondering how many people actually had that problem because like there's there's certain people that for me I have to see lips moving. It's it's just part of my hearing, I guess. I don't I don't know. It's like if I'm not if somebody's talking and I'm not looking at the person, I have to really concentrate on the audio. But if I'm looking at them, I can I can partially read lips. But I've got great hearing, so it's not it's not a hearing issue. It's just a I don't know. I don't even know what it is. So I'm curious what other people like I'm wondering if I watched it since I can see their lips moving. Would I be able to take it in better than some people that only are like auditory? You know what I mean? Yeah, the I don't remember having a problem with Dark Knight Rises while I was watching the movie, but I distinctly remember when the trailer came out and that Bane line. <laughs> I couldn't understand what the hell he was saying. <laughs> I have no idea what and, you just uh, said. <laughs> when Gotham is ashes, you have uh, my permission to die. Oh, which right. Which is uh, a neat line, but. I thought when I first, it wasn't until people were, uh, people uh, online explained it that I said, what, what is it with Gossamer's asses? What does Gossamer have to do with this? And why is he talking about their asses? It wasn't Who's until, Gossamer? <laughs> what is a Gossamer and what does he I, do? You know, when you, 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 when you say that line, it's one of those things that irritates me about Christopher Nolan. Every, it seems like every movie he's got to do it. He's going to say a line in the first third of the movie that has a, a certain feeling to it. And then the last third of the movie, it's going to have a completely different, it's going to be swapped around. Every movie seems to have it, you know, Batman What's begins. What's another has, example? Huh? What's Batman begins example? that you should have, uh, you should always mind your surroundings. And he says it to Liam Neeson at the end. And then in the dark night, there's the, um, there's, a. Uh, I know there's one in the dark night because it's one of those things that I've thought about, but it's like, he, he seems to do that a lot where there's that, I'm going to repeat a line, but it's going to have a different context at the end. And it's like, okay, I get it, you know, stop it. But it's just, I guess it's just annoying because it's like, okay, they, he kind of focused on this line. I know it's coming up later and it just annoys me. But anyway, so that's interesting, though, that, that you didn't have the problem in the movie because I remember in Dark Knight Rises, the movie, I remember going, I, especially on the plane. <laughs> what? I don't. It's like he didn't say anything. He just. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, I don't remember having any issues with it. So, yeah, and I think that's. I do, now that you mention it, I do remember that a lot of people did. So when I, when I, uh, brought up Dunkirk as the first example. Uh, yeah. Obviously, 
Dark Knight Rises was the actual first example. Just, I, th- I guess um, Dunkirk was an example that I thought of. Again, it's Tom Hardy in a mask, but I don't think it was yeah. just Tom Hardy in the, you know, as the fighter pilot in the mask that people had a problem with. I think it was a lot of the general mix. And uh, but like I said, I haven't dived enough into it to really understand what people, the more technical side of well, it. And, and well, who were the other filmmakers that um, I don't even know who they were. He were didn't. They? He didn't mention that. He didn't call anybody out. But it was just the the thing that. Um, you know, well, it wasn't Ridley Scott because Ridley Scott wouldn't be shy about it. He would be. Oh no! He one would of the say, greatest things about Sir Ridley is he doesn't care what he says and who he says it to. I mean, gosh, he will say what's on his mind. He's the best. I mean, he's he's getting up there in age, so yeah. At that point, you just don't care yeah. anymore. But no, there's the I guess the biggest point that he's making or he was trying to make is basically saying, well, in real life, you know, there are times when you know, information is being conveyed and you can't understand it because of everything going on. Yeah, I get that. But when I feel like when you're taken out of the movie because you're, you're, what did he say? You know, when you're constantly doing that, it's taking you out of the movie and nothing's being conveyed at that point except confusion. And then you miss part of, you might miss something because you're like, I don't understand what the hell they're saying. You know, it's just, it's, it's a weird thing. It's a weird. Is there balance. a parallel? Is there a parallel here with Paul Greengrass's um, shaky cam born yes. ultimatum style of shooting fight scenes? Because I, I really love the Bourne series. I mean, the first three at least, but I've never been a fan of that way of, of filming a fight scene where it's just, so you're supposed to feel like you're in the room with while well, these other two guys are smashing each other, but yeah, it's not it, as when you're I'd watching rather, something, you're not doing that. Yeah, and the other thing is the best storytelling. I mean, the way that I enjoy the c- c- cinematic storytelling when you're following a hero like Bourne is you want to be in Bourne's shoes, you know. And so when Bourne is in these fights, he's not that confused. He knows what's going on. That's why he's right. such an awesome fighter. Maybe you're maybe you're temporarily in the other guy's shoes. Who born as you know beating up with phone books and anything that's around. There's sort of MacGyver style of fighting. Um, but uh, you want to if you're in born shoes, which you are for all of the rest of the movie, you do know what's going on, and that's why he's such an awesome fighter. For most of the time, he has the upper hand, and he can at least, or even if he's getting hit, he's he recovers quickly. So I don't know. That's just a little aside that. Uh, that the way that you described Nolan's um, most intentional creation of confusion reminds me of the visual version of that, which maybe is what Paul Greengrass does. And then of course, a whole bunch of other filmmakers who don't even have Greengrass's artistic uh, vision do the same thing, just to try and add some, I don't know, some dynamism or kineticism to the fight scenes and it's even worse. So yeah, the, the shaky cam thing, maybe that's the, Maybe that's the visual analogy. I don't know. No, you're. I think you're. You're spot on with that. I mean, that is like. I mean, that's a perfect example of somebody who's doing something intentionally to create a mood or something like that. But it can be completely distracting and completely, you know, you miss the point almost. That's. I mean. Okay. Well, we're done because that basically no. <laughs> What's on that topic? Yeah, no, Next I mean, topic. it's it's a really it's a really good point though, and it's uh, it's weird because it's like I don't know, like the Dark Knight Rises was done in a way because I haven't seen Tenet either, so you know I haven't been I haven't been anywhere, pretty much. Um, but I'm curious if it was like Dark Knight Rises, where I was sitting there going, I don't. <laughs> I I don't I don't understand I don't I don't get it Oh cool look the plane's falling out of the sky or you know what I mean It's like sure I, I the that movie moved so fast and it wasn't so dense densely you know related to plot that it was necessary for me to be able to understand a hundred percent of what Bane was saying But it seems like Tenet that would have been pretty hard to I don't know. And I guess that's the thing, you know, we'll, we'll see cause it's coming out December 15th. So, um, on the Blu-rays and the, and the internets. Yeah. So, I don't even know yeah. if it's still out in cinemas here. Maybe it is. Maybe I should get it in IMAX if I still can, but I 
Because yeah. there's so yeah. few films being released um, that uh, maybe <laughs> maybe it's still going. I don't know. It was just weird that they were like, I don't know. For some reason, I kind of had it in my head that they were going to keep it in theaters for a long time. And then when I heard, oh, oh, so it's coming out in December. Okay. So it's almost like a regular movie run pre pre COVID where, you know, it's, it's usually like a 90 day window right now, you know, movie comes out the theaters and then 90 days later, it's, you can buy it. It just seems strange that you wouldn't, you know, I mean, think about like when we were kids, movies would play for a year, you know, I mean, you'd have, I know the Star Wars movies, you could, it was like six months later, you're like, you want to go see Star Wars again? Hell yeah, I want to go see Star Wars again. You could. E.T. was like that. So it's just strange that they wouldn't, they wouldn't just say, you know what, let's just keep it in theaters a little bit longer. I don't know. Or maybe it's because... Everything's getting locked back down, at least in the U.S. It's getting locked back down anyway, so it's not going to matter. I mean, what's it going to matter if we add a couple more million to our gro- our box office gross? I don't know. Yeah, it is actually still playing there. In fact, there's a 5 p.m. showing today. I I um I did half pie set up a, a an attempt to go and see it at one point because, like I said, Ree's busy, and I um, texted another one of my friends, or we were just talking. I said, "Hey, have you seen Tenet yet? This is some of that." I go to a lot of the, or we go to a lot of the, um, go to the movies quite a bit with, but she'd already seen it. So, <laughs> so that was, uh, no dice, but I mean, I'm, I, I'm never, uh, worried about going to the movies on my own either. So really saying that, um, my wife's been busy is not a real excuse. I've just been slacking on it. No, I mean, That's I, I, get, I get it, but no, I'm, I'll tell you I right feel now. The shame and I will pledge to do better. There's something to me, there's something about going to the movies by yourself. I, I don't know what that is, but it's something that I really enjoy. Um, I used to do it a lot when I was a kid. Um, and I'm talking about like 14, 15, whatever. But now, you know, it, it's a little weird. It has to be a movie that April is 100% not interested in, you know? And that's that's pretty rare. Typically we have similar tastes when it comes to movies, but like I went and saw Django Unchained by myself. Awesome. It was so much fun, you know? Sure. But anyway, uh, well, yeah, I've got no problem with it. I mean, I can't, I can't remember which movies I've seen by myself, but I don't have that thing where it's some people get embarrassed to do it because they think they look like losers, you know, oh, they can't find that person can't find anyone to go. With. They don't have any friends to go to the movies with. Like, I don't know. I'm just too old to care about what other people think about this sort of stuff. Yeah. I, I mean, I want to see the movie. I'll see it. See, what's weird is like, I, I have no problem going to a, see, uh, see a movie by myself, but I hate going into a place and eating at a table by myself. I've always found that to be weird. Like, I feel like, like, look at, look at that guy over there eating his food. <laughs> You know, and it's like, what, what does it matter? What does it, I mean, it doesn't yeah. matter, but for some reason I have an issue with that, especially if it's just like a sit down restaurant, you know? Yeah. I, know, I don't have a problem with that either. Pretty That's a lot more common now as well, because people will just go and eat and look at their phones while they're eating anyway. And right. that'll happen while people are eating together anyway. Right. But if see like people and they're out for a meal or three people and all three of them are looking at their phones, even though they're together. Right. Yeah. And see, like what I, what I used to do when uh, when I would do this is I would go and just go through like a drive through, and then I'd sit in my car with my podcasts or music or whatever I'm listening to, and that way I don't have to listen to the absolutely terrible audio that they got in the restaurant <laughs> or any of the, you know any of these inane conversations around <laughs> me. Um, yeah. That makes me sound like oh, I'm yeah. all stuck up or something, but it's just it's. You know, it's nice to just be, be by yourself. Of course, it makes your car smell like fast food or something sometimes. But hey, you know, it's just not for long. You just drive home with the windows open, you know. Right. You yeah, crank you the nine-inch that- nails up to eleven, and you drive home with the windows open. Right. Get for that fry smell out of the this. out of the car. Yeah. That's it. Uh, so let's ask. Let's 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 shift off of Nolan, and let's let me ask you, what have you? I mean, I know you've been busy working and all that, so you've had probably less time to 
you know, taken entertainment, you know, but what have you been watching? What What's, have you been starting up new, uh, series or are you just kind of chilling watching the Mandalorian or tell, tell me what's going on? I have been keeping up with the Mandalorian. The only other show I'm watching regularly, uh, apart, apart from a couple of New Zealand shows that, uh, there's one called Golden Boy and another one called Mean Mums, and they're both local comedies that will mean nothing to most of your listeners. But the other show that I've been watching that um, is more international is Avenue 5, which is from Armando Iannucci, who made Veep and The Thick of It. And uh, is it The Death of Stalin? What was that Stalin movie he made? That Stalin comedy recently. So he's this British, um, you know, creative force started in. TV has made a few movies and I was a massive fan of Veep, massive fan of the thick of it. And I mean, it's, it's not, it's been said enough, but Veep was sort of funnier when, you know, before 2016, let's just say that. I know we don't do politics on Order 42 show, but Veep, when you watch it pre-2016, it was a lot funnier. But uh, I love that show and um, Iannucci is, uh, he has a particular talent for a uh, dry but sharp british wit and avenue five is a sci-fi show it's about a um i think it might be the first space tourism expedition it's basically a massive space cruise ship and hugh laurie is the captain uh, rebecca front who is probably less famous to american audiences but she's a comedy um TV comedy icon in the UK and I've loved her in a lot of things she's uh like the becomes almost like this she's a she's not in the crew she's a passenger but she's one of those very forward she's what you might even call a Karen these days um from a certain point of view that without if you remove the political slant that sort of comes along with Karen's and it's just someone who is a, a white woman who is very forward and likes to speak to the manager that's that's who Rebecca Front plays on the show and she's always great Anyone who watched Silicon Valley, it has Zach Woods, who played Jared, the best character on Silicon Valley, one of the best TV characters of this millennium. And he basically plays the same character on Avenue 5. And so I'm a huge fan of that. He's he's just, uh, I love that guy. I love that guy. I don't know what his range is as an actor, but as a, as a comedy force who is, <laughs> he plays simultaneously sweet, and bizarre and both of the characters jared and matt the things that he says hint at a very dark very dark twisted past not that he has been a twisted person but he grew up in very like cr crazy dark conditions but has somehow stayed innocent and emerged innocent that's a common theme to his characters and i love that so um who else is in there any fans of peep show uh the british peep show um Patterson Joseph, who played uh, the boss, he turns up at one point. But anyway, it's fun. It's not really as sharp. There, there are a lot of jokes that don't quite land. It feels like that tr you can feel them aiming for things that they're not hitting. But um, it is sci-fi. It's pretty fancy, pretty nice production values. It's very British. Like one of the things that happens is they accidentally evacuate the sewer system, and so for multiple episodes, there is an orbit of effluent orbiting the ship. Uh, so, you know, poo jokes, <laughs> but there's also a lot of very sharp, you know, high level, what you might call high level humor. And uh, uh, so, yeah, not on Veep level, mm. but still fun, still very watchable. And the good parts are still really funny. So that's Avenue 5. That's the one other show apart from The Mandalorian that I've been regularly watching. So basically you're telling me that I would hate it because I hate comedies, right? You should stare well clear of it, not just okay. because of the poo jokes, okay. but because you watched, but did you watch House? I can't remember if, I think you, yes. know, you know Hugh Laurie, right? And I think you're a bit of a Hugh Laurie fan. I love Hugh Laurie. And that's what got me when you said that. I'm like, I remember when the the trailers came out for it, but I, I lost track of it. Now, what channel or is it a streaming service that you watch that on? Or is it a channel? What is that on? I think it is an HBO show. Right. Veep was HBO, mm -hmm. and I think, but I'm not sure we have 
we have uh, a whole bunch of stuff that, and a lot of the time I don't, uh, I didn't choose this. I sat down in front of it and I just happened to like it. Um, so I can't remember what it get. I think it might be HBO. Okay. But well, uh, that well, that I guess that was my curious. My, my I was curious about that. Is that like you know? Yeah, we have it on HBO and it's on HBO Max. But I didn't know if that was something that you had in New Zealand, if or if it was on a on a different channel. Because I know like like all the UFC stuff, for example, is on completely different stuff than what you watch it on. You know, you watch it on like we watch it on ESPN. I don't think you even have ESPN. We have ESPN here as well. We have two ESPN oh. channels. Oh, okay. We, we have an HBO. We have a thing called Soho, but it's basically just HBO. It's just, I guess, how it's branded here, where Sky, who is our, has been our, at least until streaming really caught on. Sky was our satellite, um, as our major satellite provider in this country, and it's where you would get all HBO and anything that wasn't free to air, basically, for about 30 years now, is it? And mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, long story short, we get this. We've got this channel. One of the channels on Sky is called Soho, and they play all the HBO stuff. That's where I saw Veep and, you know, all the way back to uh, Sopranos and what have you. Yeah, and Veep is one of those that I've always wanted to watch, and I just never got around to it. And then, uh, like now, I'm hooked on uh, – I'm making my way through Mr. Robot. Um, I'm not finished yet. I think I have one I think I just finished season three and there's four seasons. And I remember when it first came out and I'm like, oh I love Christian Slater. And then I don't know why it just went off my radar, but now I'm like, man, I feel like Christian Slater is due a big comeback. Like a big one. Like Keanu Reeves level comeback. That dude is is good. He's just a good actor, and he's got a lot of charisma. I just love that guy. So, of course, I'm I'm in. And uh, and Ra I've said it, uh, Rami Malek. Holy crap, that guy. I'm I'm in for whatever. He's one of those. He's now in that. Just off of this show, off of this performance, I'm in on whatever he wants to do. I'm there. I can't wait for No Time to Die because to see him as a villain is going to be awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about that guy. So, yeah, Mr. Robot. Yeah, I haven't seen uh, I Robot. Christian Slater often used to get um, you said I Robot. criticized for basically doing. Uh, did I say I Robot? What's it yeah. called? Mr. Robot. Mr. Robot. Now Christian Slater would get criticized for doing a, a Jack Nicholson impression back in the day, and that was what I liked about him. Yeah, <laughs> he was basically doing. Like the way he would talk, you know, it was kind of like he watched a lot of Jack. Yeah. You know, was doing like a young Jack. And I always liked that about him. I mean, I, I, um, I love him. I think he's true. Great. Romance is uh, one of the best. <sighs> he's great in that. I like him when he turned up in uh, Young Guns too. Pretty much everything. I've never had a bad time watching Christian Slater do anything. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's one of those where, and I won't say anything if you ever, you know, if you try it out. Because there's a lot of twists and turns in this show. And I would even hazard to say that so far, it's got a very, an almost Breaking Bad kind of feel to it. Where it just, it, the, the story keeps getting bigger and bigger, and the stakes get keep getting bigger and bigger. It's pretty awesome. I really like it. But uh, Which one of them plays the robot? Uh, it's actually, the, the robot is actually played by Anthony Daniels. You know, basically. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's not true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's uh, yeah, Mr. Robot is just a name, but it's. I'm I like. Yeah, I, said, I had a I feeling even... neither of them are a robot. I was just trying to make a dumb joke, but then your dumb joke uh, out dumb joked mine. Hey, hey, so, that's uh, you and that one. You know, it's it's fun. It's fun, but you no, know, I I I highly, I don't. I guess it's kind of like. It's sort of like if you only saw A New Hope and then Empire Strikes Back and you hadn't seen how it all turns out. Really, guys? 
you wouldn't really say, oh, yeah, this is the best thing ever. You know, it's the best trilogy ever. You don't know yet. So, like, I haven't seen that last season. And if and if they stick the landing on the season, it could make the whole thing just be like, okay, yeah, this is one of my favorite series or whatever. But right now, I'm just really enjoying it. And it's I'm having fun just kind of not worrying about spoilers or anything because nobody's talking about it. You know, it's kind of it's kind of nice. Because that's the big thing about Mandalorian is that uh, I have to wait until April's off of work on Friday to watch it because she really wants to watch it. And I want to watch it with her. You know, I don't want to, I want to experience, I want to experience it with her. So now let me ask this. Are the, are those episodes of the Mandalorian, do they come out kind of like Clone Wars did when we would, you know, it would release on Friday at, for me, it was 2, 2 a.m. Yeah. Does it release the same time for you? So you've seen this last episode. Yeah. Yeah, I've, have I seen the last episode, did you say? Yeah. I've seen it twice. Okay. I watch it as soon as it comes out. I was, well, I, I haven't been staying up to watch it. Um, I've been watching it the next morning and then uh, in the evening, we'll often, uh, we'll often watch it uh, for dinner as well. Right. Watch it for dinner. Well, <laughs> and, and now dinner since... Viewing. Right, right. Now since... I, I mean, I think you've 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 kind of noticed what I've been doing is that the Saturday show, I kind of, let's, let's not get in too crazy into spoilers, but I do, I did want to ask you about it. I was hoping you'd watched it. Um, what did you think of it? I've been enjoying the whole, I've enjoyed the whole season so far. It's one of those things where I've, um, gone a lot easier on nitpicking because there are things in it where I think that's an odd decision. Why, why would he do that instead of doing something else, which seemed like it would make a lot more sense. But um, overall, I just enjoy it. I just go along for the ride with these, with the show now. And um, like I, like I do with the first season and I've, I've enjoyed all of them. I mean, there's someone who turns up in this episode that was <laughs> so cool to see and uh, made me very appreciative of watching certain other Star Wars stories. Um, I was going to so, ask. Yeah, that. I dug it. I would probably, I would give it at least an eight out of ten, probably even a nine out of ten if I was going to. I haven't really thought about what rating I'd give it. Uh, let's say eight. Uh, well, I can tell you. So just really had a fun time with it both I times can, I watched it. Yeah, and I guess my thing is that. I felt like the last episode felt like I almost feel like it was, and of course it is, it was half of the story, but it didn't feel like there was any, Oh, they, they got off the planet. You know what I mean? That was really the end of the episode. You're just kind of like, okay. And this one, man, I've told you about the the moment, the the kinds of moments that make me love something is when you're just like you almost just come out of your seat like okay holy crap. I literally yelled out loud, "Oh my god!" When that moment happened, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. I, the music kicked in, and I was just like, "Holy crap!" We're, it's like. The thing about the Mandalorian and the way that they've been marketing things and the way that things have been leaked, it's almost, it does a disservice to that initial moment of surprise. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, yeah. it's kind of like, I mean, we can talk about a little bit about spoilers in the first two episodes. I don't want to do it on the third, but like the first episode, you know, we got, now I'm going to say it wrong again. You say it, Morrison. How, how Tim do you Wera say Morrison. Huh? Tim Wera, or you can just say Tim Wera. Tim right. Wera Morrison. All right, so him, Boba Fett being basically reintroduced into Star Wars. The first time we've seen him post Sarlacc Pit, it was like, holy crap, that was such a cool moment. 
how much more cool would that have been if we hadn't seen uh, heard the reports of him showing up as Boba Fett in The Mandalorian Season 2? It's like all of these things, it's, we're, we live in a world where we want it all now. And it does a disservice to the amount of surprise that you could get if you didn't know something was coming. So, like, if we hadn't heard about a certain person being cast in Season 2 that's in this last episode, if we hadn't already heard that that was happening, the title of the episode would have been like, well, what does that mean? Instead, as soon as the the title card came up, I'm like, okay, I know exactly who that is. I know exactly what's happening. I know what's coming. It's sort of like what I talked about, about, about Vader being in Rogue One. How much cooler would it have been if he hadn't been in the whole movie and the first time you saw him is when he ignites his saber on, you know, at the end of that hallway? You would have been like, holy crap, we didn't know he was going to be in it. Instead, they show the back of his helmet and his breathing in a trailer months before. I don't know. It's one of those things where you there's that that thing where you you know you got to market the movie you got to make people want to come see it you got to make people excited but come on man leave the surprises leave the surprises in there am I, I don't am think I, you can stop things I, I'm not sure if you can stop things like that from leaking is there any problem you know like it's right. gonna leak anyway so embrace it I think that's probably probably their attitude not not so much with the Rogue One thing I think with Rogue One they're gonna market that anyway but with the show. I don't get. I, I don't see how you keep a lid on it, given how um, rabid a lot of uh, fans are about getting information on these things, and given how massive the productions are. There's, I, I guess, I would just assume that it, it's impossible to stop it from leaking. So you just embrace it anyway, and then it's one of those things where um, I, I don't think there's a way around it either, because you can't just avoid all of the news if you're if you're passionate about these shows, especially you're doing what you do. I mean, but uh, for someone who doesn't do a show about the news where they have to keep up with the news, you know, I don't follow movie news religiously, but even I, I still find out about these things just because of the online circles that I move in, you know, the chat groups and what have you. So right. I don't know. I just don't, uh, I get what you're saying, but I don't see if the, I don't see any other way to do it. Well, it's like the Mandalorian, the season one, the child, nobody knew that was coming. They kept that on, I mean, that was a surprise for everybody. And it was like, and then you could, you watched it just explode the excitement that rippled through right. the internet. And it was such a, it became a phenomenon because it was such a surprise. And it was like, how in the hell did they keep this a secret? You know what yeah, I mean? That's a good point. And it's like you look at how that was received versus how this was like, oh yeah, cool. But no, I, it's I have I don't know what you call this. We've talked about it. It's that weird thing where I almost forget how to use my brain during a a movie or a TV show. The beginning of the episode starts. The title card comes up. I go, yeah, I'm pretty sure I know who that is. Completely forgot about what the title of the show was. By the time we get to the part where things happen and you know what I'm talking about. It's, I just feel like, uh, just keep the surprises, quit marketing the stuff and, and, and agents. If you're, if you're, yeah. if one of your actors is going to be in a big high profile show, don't ruin it for people. Come on. I just think about that. And I'm so irritated that the fact that we knew that he was going to be in it, Think about how that would have been at the end of the sh- at the end of that episode, and he turns around and you're like, "Okay, what the hell?" Even though there was the whole thing about the the jingling spurs and all that stuff in season one, I don't know. Am I am I beating a dead horse here? I don't. Know, I feel like I am. No, it's always fun to see you get mad at things. You know, I've always been <laughs> one of the reasons I've followed you for so long is that you're funny when you get mad at things. So, um, I agree. I agree with you that it would have been cooler in both instances if it had been a complete yeah. surprise uh and yeah it's a good point about how they keep yoda under wraps and i wonder if like you sort of hinted at there if it's easier to do that if you're talking about a thing that's a puppet and a cg um create puppet slash cg creation depending on the scene versus an actor but i don't know hmm. 
Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Because I mean, I think uh, I think some. It's almost like I feel like like you know you've got your deadline and Variety and Hollywood Reporter and Screen Rant, all those different sites. It's almost like they have spies that work at agencies. And when they hear about a casting call or they hear or they hear about a meeting taking place, and that's how like like Mads Mikkelsen is in talks to replace Johnny Depp for Fantastic Beasts 3. Maybe that was it was just announced after Johnny put out his statement. But they didn't just do that in a few days. You know, you had to know that that had been in the works for a while. So how did that stay under wraps? You know what I mean? It's yeah. like there's certain things where I'm like, I just don't understand the patterns. You know, about because you know they had to be Warner Brothers had to be had to have been looking at that situation with Johnny and Amber Heard and saying, We need a backup plan. So what do we like? And then they went through the list and they contacted some actors. Mads Mikkelsen obviously was interested in playing the role, so they were like, "Okay, well, let's see what how this plays out, you know." But if he's out, you're in. So it had to have been in the works for a long, long time. It's just like the Snyder Cut; they had to have known about that they were going to release it and they were going to do it months prior, and that's why Zack Snyder kept dropping hints all the time. It's because he knew it was already a done deal. Right. But anyway. I don't know. I just find that whole that whole thing the way that they decide to release information and not. And I just wish they would keep those things under wraps a little longer. Would have been would have been a thing. But yeah, how happy are you that you got to look at some of those old Star Wars the older Star Wars stuff that you had skipped prior? I mean, it yeah, made that, so much depth, right? It's I got to be honest, man. I'm watching the show uh, yesterday, and I had to fight back a little bit of happy tears. I can't explain. It's such a simple thing, really. But I feel like the Mandalorian right now is almost like John Favreau and Dave Filoni are sitting cross-legged on the floor with all the action figures from the Star Wars saga. And they're just kind of going, I think this and this would work. And they just, it's it's awesome. It really is awesome, and it does something to that fanboyish thing that's in my in my soul. It's it's beautiful. So yeah, yeah. I thought they did a great jo- job with their character too. Really linked up well with the other versions that we've seen. Yeah, I'm just felt like it just felt like it feels like all one story, you know. Well, I think that's the beautiful thing, right? Is that yeah. when you can when you can do that and when it works man it is so fulfilling if you're a fan if you're not a fan you just watch it and you go oh that was pretty cool but if you're a fan it means even more to you and I think that's the thing that I think both of them Filoni's been a master at that you know for years now you know sitting at yeah. Lucas at the Lucas's table you know and learning from him it's and then Favreau's been doing it for a long, long, long time. He used to, he did that a lot with the Iron Man movies. He would drop little hints of things. And if you're a fan, you're like, Oh, and then like, I'm, I was not a huge fan. So I was just like, Oh, that was pretty cool. And then you see the YouTube video of the super fan after you get home from watching the movie and you go, Oh, that's what that was. That's actually really cool. You know, that they added that little detail in for the fans. I just love what they're doing. And I don't, I can't think of a better show right now that's just all around just awesome. It's just so good. And the budget has that's to That's better been... than iRobot? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's 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 touching that, that fanboy kind of thing for me. Of course, yeah. you know, I, I can't... I love it, but... Yeah, the second time I watched it, like I said, uh, um, let's just say that uh, not everyone in the room had watched the other shows and knew exactly who their character was. And the comments were, wow, she's badass. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll stop talking about it now because I'm, I'm giving away spoilers without trying to. But let's say the character was a hit, even with people who didn't know their character's uh, 
epic background. Well, that's that's one of the things. In fact, it was because there's basically two set pieces. Again, trying to avoid the spoilers for those of you who hadn't watched it yet. But there's two action pieces, set pieces. The second one, the beginning of it. There is a shot. There is a shot. And if you know, it's just like you, you. I know you're looking for Dutch angles. There's a nice little Dutch angle at the beginning of that second set piece. Um, and I thought of you when I saw it. And then there's almost like it's almost like um, it kind of almost reminiscent of the uh, the action star turning away from an explosion as he's walking slowly toward the camera and not looking at it. You know, there's a scene, there's a shot, a specific shot that made me say out loud, and I quote, they're going to sell a shitload of stuff from this show. Because <laughs> it was like, I just felt like, wow, they, the fact that they keep layering things on, it's just, it's so masterfully done. It's so nice to see. I just love it. You know, it. um... I'm not. I'm not. I don't want to tell you how to run your own show here. But what we could do is at the end, uh, say in uh, like if we're going to go for another fifty minutes or whatever, maybe yeah. in forty minutes we do the spoiler version. We do like spoiler discussion and you know what's funny is about I, the spoilers I'd stuff. Actually, but you just put it at the end of the episode so that anyone who doesn't want to hear the spoilers can tune out. I'd actually thought of that and thought, you know what? Let's let's uh, let's do that. Let's do that. So yeah, probably it. Well, in thirty-five minutes, we'll uh, we'll do that. So at so at two forty-five. Right. If you haven't seen the Mandalorian season two, episode three, or chapter eleven, God, if you haven't done that. Just be careful because we're gonna we're gonna get into it. Now let me ask you something else because this is something this is kind of a gen ge- uh, like a generic thing. What do you like? What do you subscribe to? You you obviously you have Disney Plus, but do you have any of the other like streaming service type things? Yeah, Netflix we have, and we don't have. Uh, no, I can't. I'm just thinking Soho. What's the? There's one that's got a ho ho hobo. There's another one that's very famous that we don't have. No, we <laughs> really have. Uh, What's it called? I don't kind of think of it. Does well, there's a end? Hulu. Hulu. We don't have Hulu. Uh, no, we really... Uh, D- uh, Disney Plus and Netflix are the two main ones. There is another one. And we have like the HBO or our version of the HBO stuff. So we've got mm-hmm. a, ton of, a ton of options at all times. And so, I mean, I don't watch that much anyway. So I'm never, I'm never short on right. those to watch. Um, but yeah, not Hulu. What are the other ones? What are the main ones? I guess, uh, I mean, Netflix is the big one and we've had that for a long time. So what are the other ones that you subscribe to? I think the only one that you didn't mention is, uh, I have Amazon prime. Amazon I had for the boys, but uh, I don't keep it running all the time. Mm. In fact, I have still haven't seen the boys season two cause I haven't, uh, mm. um, because what I did for the boys season one is I just took I I took Amazon for a month and then I canceled it. Yeah, see, the, and it's not that there aren't other things that I want to see on there. There are definitely other things I want to see in there. But like I said, I just I don't even have time to see everything. I that, that's on Netflix or even on Disney Plus. I haven't started watching the right stuff yet. There's yeah. that star yeah. like episode six on uh, Disney Plus, and, and so, so there's just too many things I want to see, and so I ha- had to like uh, so I canceled Amazon Prime for now. Yeah. Ooh. I've- drop stuff um yeah i'm i'm one of those where a lot of the stuff we have because we have something else right like i have amazon prime because i have the prime shipping thing and then uh and that's something that april got a long time ago and we've just kept it because i mean gosh why not um especially if you buy a lot of stuff on amazon which we do and then uh Disney Plus, of course, we were able to sign up for the three years at a cheaper price, so it ends up being like, 
I don't remember what it what we paid, but I I know that it ended, ends up being like four dollars and something and change per month. Yeah, and that's that it was the deal. deal that we signed up for before it actually released. So that I mean, of course, amazing deal. We have Netflix, and that's I think going up to fourteen ninety nine a month now. So yeah, I think if you're a Netflix subscriber, I think it's eleven ninety nine. It was eleven ninety nine or twelve ninety nine. Now it's fourteen ninety nine. Um, and then we have HBO Max, and the only reason we have HBO Max is because we have an unlimited plan with AT and T. So we get it for free, I guess, because AT and T and HBO and Warner Brothers, they're all, I guess it's all under Warner or something. I don't know how that works, but we get it for free. Now, I don't think I would have paid for it, but I got to tell you right now, HBO is one of my favorites for like just in general. I love the fact that one of the best things about it is it's something that nobody does is the they they have a just added section so you can see what's new you see you have a what's uh they they have last chance you know so it's the stuff that's leaving at the end of the month so you know okay if i want to watch any of that i got to watch it now and then the next one is coming soon so it's it gives you if you want to go in there and see i i've already looked through everything i just want to see what's new you can do that without watching a YouTube video like Netflix puts out and I think Amazon even puts out a YouTube video that says hey there's all the trailers for everything that's coming out and it's 20 minutes of stuff and you're like I don't want to do that just show them to me I love the fact that HBO Max does that but other than that their programming is great their original programming is great their classic movies are awesome it's, it's great I love it but I think if you're a parent you've got to have Disney Plus I yeah you know if you've got kids yeah i guess um netflix has trending now which i guess is where a lot of the new stuff goes but it's not the same thing is it it's not the same as having an actual uh here's what's new right because it's i think that's the thing about um about netflix is that they are constantly getting new because i gotta be honest i don't care what brand new series they most of the time i don't care about their series their new series and stuff unless it's a you know a lot of people are talking about it you know and they are constantly putting up new what i would consider to be catalog titles right the older stuff that's the stuff i'm interested in oh holy crap i mean this is just just an example but it's like oh holy crap they have spies like us this you know they just got spies like us i want to watch spies like us you know um but they're not going to put that in the trending, you know? And right. that's why I rely on that, uh, that just watch yeah. app because it shows you everything that's new, which is nice. But you haven't started watching the right stuff. Have you? Mm-mm. In fact, I haven't watched, I hadn't even opened Disney plus in a long time until the Mandalorian started up again. But there's a lot of good stuff. I know that there's there's stuff. Uh, in fact, uh, my dad has told me that there's there's some things on there that that I should watch. And and of course, I haven't watched. I don't think I've watched a single National Geographic thing on there. And that's some awesome awesome stuff. I can zone out for hours on that. But it's probably the same reason why I'm not watching a whole lot of uh, my friends' stream right now. Because <laughs> it's like I find myself sucked in, and then I get nothing done. Right. So, yeah, I'll put up and put on nature shows when uh, I'm in the kitchen or something, you know, doing doing something else. And it's usually it's a David Attenborough thing because oh, yeah. I grew up on David Attenborough shows, you know, as a kid. When you know we had the show, we had Our World that was on every Sunday night here. It was just called Our World, and it would always be a nature show, and 80 percent of the time it'd be David Attenborough. So that guy's voice is just one of those voices of. That's just always been there throughout my whole life, and I just love love hearing him talk about stuff. But one thing you notice that always with those episodes, with those shows, it starts off here's what's wonderful, here's how it's our planet is dying, yeah, and here's how these creatures are going through heartbreak because the environment's being smashed. Well, and then at the end, but here's what we can do. You know, here's the hope. 
So um, you don't sort of watch them for a, a good time all the time, but uh, yeah, I just David Embar can do no wrong in, in my book. Yeah, I I love I love that kind of stuff, and um, but I mean that's that's something that's sort of uh, I mean, gosh, Sagan did that back in the old Cosmos. It was the same yeah. kind of thing. He would he would yeah. beat you over the head for thirty minutes about how bad humans are. And then show how beautiful humans can be, and this is what we can do to get better. And it's like, I don't know. It's it's tried and true, you know. Yeah. You introduce the problem, and then you introduce the solution, the possible solution. But oh yeah, man. Uh, I've loved uh, what Planet Earth was great. Um, what was it called? Life. I think I enjoyed that. Yeah. One. Yeah, there's a whole, that's the one about, that's sort of more, oh, there's actually one about him. I can't remember the names of a lot of these things, but. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah, he's done, there's a whole lot that have Planet in the title. Yeah, the other thing that uh, I have watched quite a bit of, although it's another one of those things that I'll put on, like if there's no Order 42 for me to put on in the other screen in the, as the background, I'll put on uh, Letterman. My next guest needs no introduction. There's not. A whole bunch of those episodes but i've enjoyed some of those um i still haven't i've watched bits and pieces of one episode and i can't even remember which one it was but i really the ones really that what surprised me about it is the ones that i've enjoyed the most are the people that i had the least sort of interest in i mean i don't know if you know the um maybe i shouldn't even say it because i'm a fan of her music but there's a let's just say there's a musician that's on a on a, one of the recent episodes that uh, I like her music, but the episode I found sort of boring. Whereas the Kim Kardashian one who, you know, Kim Kardashian is almost like a punchline or, or, you know, keeping up with the Kardashians is like a punchline of lowbrow um, entertainment for, you know, anyone who wants to sneer and be snooty about their entertainment. But uh, that episode was awesome. She's a, uh, like I didn't, she's pretty cool. She's actually pretty, she's actually pretty cool in her own way. You know, she's, uh, as like, she's also sort of a, a, a legal, um, just she's a justice system activist. She's helping get people, uh, you know, out of prison who have been, um, wrongfully convicted. And so, I mean, and she has, she's, I mean, I had always just believed the narrative that she's this bimbo who got famous because of a sex tape tape. And obviously that sort of was a big part of how they, you know, she was a Paris Hilton friend or whatever, but what she's, um, what she, you didn't know, but you didn't expect this today. Let's get Bucci on. And at one point he's going to talk about how cool Kim Kardashian is. Hey, you put money on that. You would have been long odds, but anyway, that, that episode of David Letterman, you know, she's, uh, she's, she's cool to me. Um, there's one other one. I can't remember off the top of my head, but the other thing I always try and watch is Seinfeld's comedians and cars getting coffee, not just because of, he always has fun guests, but man, the cars are just so fun. The cars that he gets uh, on the show. Oh yeah. Is, he has such great taste. In, and they're obviously not his cars. They're sort of donated for the episode and he sort of features them. But yeah, I love that. That um, If you're into cars and you enjoy comedians, I mean, look who, who he's had on there, Eddie Murphy, Martin Short. And Martin Short's another one of those people. If you're a bit of a snob about comedy, you look down on Martin Short and he's just, you know, silly and goofy or whatever, but I've always loved, loved Martin Short. So those are the other two things, apart from Avenue 5 and those two Kiwi shows that I told you about is uh, my next guest needs no introduction and Comedians Cars Getting Copy, both on Netflix, I believe. Well, there you go. Hashtag not sponsored. But no, it's... I'm I'm right there with you though on comedians and cars getting coffee. I don't. That's the weird thing about it is that I, I don't make it a regular thing to watch, but when I do yeah, watch it, I really enjoy it. It's like I really really enjoy it. Um, it's just it's strange. And I guess one of the other things that I always enjoy. It's really, in a weird, way, I enjoy it in almost every aspect of entertainment if you're in the public eye you get two people who do similar things and for their job and they talk shop yeah. i love that so yeah. when two comedians are sitting there talking about comedy i love it like there's that one and and i, I know louis ck is you know still on a lot of people's uh 
shit list right now. But it was Louis C.K., Ricky Gervais, Chris Rock, and Jerry Seinfeld. And it was this little round table, and I loved it. I loved every minute of it. Listening to them talk about their own comedy and how they approach things and how it was fascinating. In fact, and Ricky Gervais is another one. He's very, con- you know, controversial to a lot of people, but they are incredibly smart and and thoughtful about what they do. Yeah. And I love that, and I love seeing that kind of behind the scenes kind of thing. It's just like, you know, you get them on. Let's be honest. You get them on Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's one of those that he gets that kind of that kind of thing. You know what I mean? And I love that. Sure. I love that realism. Uh, you know, th- th- these are just regular people who have a job and they try to hit those marks. You know what I mean? I just think it's cool. But yeah, well, there's an, there are two episodes of Comedians in Cars with Gervais. I think they split it into two because it was so uh, they have such a good time. Those two together that uh, they get so much. They got so much good footage that they split into two episodes. So if you want to see some more Gervais in. Um, Seinfeld doing this thing. There's a couple of those if you haven't seen them yet. It's, it's, in cars. it's such a weird thing. It's like, you know, a lot of comedians in general, they get just like actors. They almost get sectioned off into this. Well, they are only this kind of comedy. You know, like Ricky, most people probably just think Ricky Gervais. Oh, he just, that's all he knows is controversy. You know, that's all he is. No, he's not. He's a very multiple, there's multiple layers of comedy there that he can do. It's just that that's the one that he's the most famous for, and it's the one that gets him the most attention, right? Yeah. But it's, at the same time, really amazing guy outside of this this shell that the, that society's kind of made for him. There's a lot more to him than that. But I can yeah, understand. If you watch his TV shows, he, and he even talks about this, I think, in, in the Seinfeld, uh, one of the Comedians in Cars episodes, his TV shows are very concerned with um, trying to dial in on, on what's at the heart of human nature, or at least some parts of human nature. Like he's not just trying to make you cringe, uh, which is what he sort of got famous for with The Office, but the, the thing, the reason that he can, he's so good at making that that cringe comedy in The Office is that he gets human nature and he recognizes what's real about that character, that yes. David Brent character that he first got famous for, that as, as much as you just want to slap that guy, he de- there is like a vulnerability to him and you t- can tell that it's coming from a place of um, pain almost like it's a guy who has a sort of a it's coming from an insecurity and that that doesn't excuse anything like a bad behavior is bad behavior and there's not an excuse for it no matter what condition you've got or what you know childhood you had bad behavior is bad behavior but recognizing the humanity in that character is what makes it compelling because right. the cringe you can't you can't make cringe comedy if you don't make the characters real the, the least real you make them the more it becomes a cartoon and you don't the, the cringe comes from recognizing the humanity right it's yeah almost like uh i was gonna say like if because i only watched i hadn't watched all of the like the british version of the office but you look at how you know uh why am I drawing blank on his name? The, the American David Office. Brent, Ricky Gervais? No, the American version of Office. Steve Carell? Steve Carell. Gosh, I was just like, I completely went blank for a second. But you watch how he starts off the exact same way. But there's there's almost a childish quality the way that he brought Michael, you know, his character. But then by the end of the series, you love him. You don't. You know, and it's just like, it's so weird how I wonder if the British version of The Office had allowed to grow and breathe the way that the American Office had. Would he, would that that humanity have shown itself more in his care in his version of the character? You know what I mean? Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know I, whether that whether that would have happened, but it's notable that 
the last um and I, I wasn't as big a fan of uh afterlife in fact we didn't get through all of season two season one was pretty good but season two started feeling repetitive but it, it whether he pulled it off or not, it really shows you where his, where he's at, where what his sensibility is, and that it's not just all about being um, shocking. You know, he's really trying to get at real things, and to the point that a lot of it is not even real comedy. And it's, I mean, Afterlife as as a guy who's who is basically picks up just after his wife died of cancer, and the whole show was him trying to put his life back together after losing his wife to cancer and basically right. every episode features some part where he's sitting there watching on his laptop you know sitting there with his dog watching videos of his of his um wife you know when she was still alive and so there's a real melancholy air to it hmm. that uh you know he he's and even when he is doing the controversial stuff it does come from a place of he's a thoughtful guy and he has a he he's really from a working class sort of background he's not one of the um i mean with british entertainment especially with actors especially with the the thespian world a lot of them come from come through uh academies or come through fancy schools whereas he's a guy that has never got away from his working class roots you know and i think he even talks I don't know. I've I've read a lot of. I mean, I've watched a lot of videos with him. He might even talk about this in um, comedians and cars with uh, Seinfeld. But he talks about his working class background and about he's never wanted to leave that behind and about how. You know, I'm just going to say it again about how what that taught him about humanity. Yeah, I see. I, I I love that stuff. I I don't know. I guess the the weird thing about with comedy is that you know, like. Dane Cook isn't the Dane Cook that's on stage. You know, he's multi-layered. They're all, they're multi-layered people. And sometimes it's interesting to get that other, that other side. I don't know. But that's, that's actually, it's funny. It's not actually the reason I brought this whole up. The reason I brought it up was much simpler. And that was with these streaming services, You've experienced both ways of delivery. Drop the whole season or week to week. What yeah, you... I, prefer, I prefer the week to week, the traditional week to week style. I far prefer it. That's what I loved about Game of Thrones. Like the last show I was really in love with before Mandalorian was Game of Thrones. And one of the things that made it so great and made it such a massive deal was that it was a week to week thing. And so each episode yeah. gets to breathe as its own piece of the story and uh, the even though I haven't engaged in the um, chit chat and speculation with the Mandalorian anywhere near as much as I used to with Game of Thrones that was a massive part of what I loved about Game of Thrones right I, I, I listened to at least three Game of Thrones podcasts every week um, sometimes more you know when something massive happened on that show I would like grab 10 of them you know and during the week I would listen to these 10 just to see what the uh, other podcasters how they how they were reacting to this stuff and uh mandalorian I, there was one that i listened to which is actually one that i found during my game of thrones time was a, the same podcasters but um i haven't been listening to as many uh, mandalorian podcasts but i do like that he, he, you get to chit chat about it in between times and it's not all just one big dump you know yeah i, I prefer the weekly thing yeah i mean it's it's how we did it with clone wars right clone wars did the same yeah. thing and it's, yeah I and it. I think that it's it's such a weird thing. It really depends on how the episode goes. Like for me, as we had mentioned, or as I had mentioned, last week's episode I wasn't a huge fan of just because it felt like it was incomplete and it felt like it just ended. I was like, oh, okay, so they're okay. But I guarantee you now watching both of those back to back, it's going to feel like a better episode, but I still prefer the week to week too. I don't like the, let's just drop it all and you can just binge it in one day. And I was, I think we were talking about at one point we were talking about uh, stranger things and how they just dump it. And I think they dumped it on Halloween and we were done. We watched it all in one day, April and I on a Sunday 
And then we we're like, okay, well, well, that's done. <laughs> and it was just like, okay, I don't know. I think, like you said, I agree with you. I think the 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 coolest thing about having the week to week is that conversation that happens in between. But yeah, yeah, Game of Thrones. I watched the first season in a binge because I didn't get into the show straight away. Uh, um, I had sort of. <laughs> I mean, you and I've talked about this before, and I don't want to get into this. But after Lost, I made a a, um, a, a vow to myself: I'm not going to get into sh- any show before it uh, before it finishes, and I know it has a good ending, <laughs> and it wraps up. And so that's how I started with Game, Game of Thrones. I ignored the first season, but then one of my uh, mates was yapping about it. He gave me um, the DVDs, and uh, so I watched it, and. Uh, after that, I was just hooked. But so, but I far preferred, you know, after that, I, I just love the the week to week thing. And yeah, you, that's the way to go. So you you had never read the books, right? You would. You just like no. the show. The did yeah, I've you never read any of the books? Were you were you a fan of how it ended? I'm just curious. I don't I don't remember if we've talked about this before. I thought that uh, I just thought this. I, I didn't mind the the positions of the chess pieces at the end, but I didn't think the storytelling was great. Mm-hmm. I didn't think it, they, the storytelling was as sharp as the show went on, you know. And I don't think it was just the last season that suffered from that. I mean, I think from a, I had problems with it with certain episodes in previous seasons as well. I mean, all the way back to season two when Danny is just it feels like wheel spinning the whole of season two after her, she has this awesome season one. So it's not like I'm going to say it was perfect and then it was rubbish at the end there. But um, yeah, if I had to sum it up, I'd say where everything ended and how everyone ended up, I was happy with, but I felt like some of the storytelling was uh, wanting. Yeah, no. And I, and I, I get that. I was just, I was just curious because I'm was never a huge game of thrones fan i mean i i liked it and i remember liking other seasons some seasons better than others and i remember feeling i want to say it was season like i said i don't know i don't know but i don't know which one which one was the one that kind of made me go okay this feels like the whole season they treaded water was it the one where aria is in the house of black and white learning how to become an assassin I don't think so. I think it was. The I think season that was season before. five. That was another wheel spinny bit where, I, where, Arya had met old. Um, what was his name? I can't remember the guy's name, but he was the assassin, right? Yeah. When she was, remember, she spent uh, quite a bit of that season with Tyrion, and she was like mm-hmm. Tyrion, not Tyrion, Tywin, Tywin Lannister's um, servant yeah. boy, uh, and uh, oh, that was I cool because like everything with Tywin was awesome, and then. In her escape from Harren, that was while Tywin was at Harren Hall, and then and making her escape from there, this assassin helped her out, and he was the one who gave her the coin from the House of Black and White. And so when she went to the House of Black and White, he was the teacher there. I can't remember that guy's name. Anyway, it had been this cool thing where she was obviously learning; it was building up to her becoming this um, badass. And so I had so looked forward because I love kung fu training scenes in movies and tv shows you know i mean empire strikes back is basically a kung fu training um movie right uh right. that's what i love and so i'd been so looking forward to when they got there in game of thrones and then that was just such a letdown that was another wheel spinny but i think that was season five i don't know but it turns out that uh, that was a bad guess on my part because that wasn't what you were thinking of well i don't know i that's what i'm saying i don't remember what it was that made me kind of say like okay I don't care anymore. And then, was it Bran? Was it something to do with Bran? I don't remember. I don't remember Brand what Brand North was. of the Wall? Because, look, it's kind of like what I had explained with, and I don't remember how I got into this, but it was something about storytelling in general. When something bad is happening to the characters, that it seems like it's longer than it actually is. Because I remember when I was reading Order of the Phoenix... I hated, I really, when I finished the book, I'm like, okay, that, that ended great, but I didn't, overall, I didn't like the book. And it was because the beginning where, um, Umbridge is 
kind of torturing Harry, it felt like it took forever for him to finally get the upper hand. But then after I listened to the, to the audio books, it goes by just fine because I knew that there was a, there was a, there was a nice end point. I knew that it was, ah, she's going to get hers. It's going to be okay. Once I knew that, then that troubles, that troublesome section that I thought was a troublesome section really wasn't. It's just because it was so like, I remember somebody saying, uh, the beginning of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. They're like, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't even get going into that story because he's, he's stuck with his aunt and uncle and they're torturing him for so long. And I'm like, that's only like one chapter. So you couldn't get through one chapter, but I guess it really depends on how you perceive that, that part of the story. It might seem like it just takes forever because you're, you're being empathetic with the character when in reality it's just, they're telling the story and that you've got to get that low point to get to the high point. I don't know. Am I making any sense? Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. The, the, uh, we've talked about Lord of the Rings before and how it took me three tries to get past the first hundred pages. I think. Yeah. First, I tried it twice and quit and quit. And this is, I'm talking about when I'm 13 or 14 or whatever, but uh, the other part of that book, that's a slug is, you know, Frodo and Sam's journey because Frodo is suffering so much. And mm. I mean, this is not really a good analogy because it really does take a long time. I mean, there's a big books, long books, but uh, I remember not enjoying that part of the story. The first time I was uh, reading it just because Frodo was obviously suffering so much and going through so much torment. Um, but yeah, like I said, that's, I shouldn't have even put that up. That's a terrible analogy because that does take a long time, especially if you're a slow reader like I am. Are you reading oh. anything at the moment, by the way? Cause you, you are a reader and, uh, you what something you used to talk about often in your other in your previous uh solo shows was what you're yes. reading lately you got you on any um book trips lately yes in fact uh real quick oh pining ben i believe that's how you said 1974 thank you for the follow i appreciate that as always really quick you guys watching i love it i i it's it means so much to to me and and i mean gosh this has been it's it's been great hanging out with Bucho and stuff. So thank you for following. Thank you for watching. Um, but yes, I have been reading. I I I don't know if I'd actually mention that I finished Dune. Did I say you that? I don't think you mentioned that you finished that. Uh, uh, there are. Um, yeah, I don't think so. I don't remember you mentioning that. I've yeah. got to say I have. I've listened to. Uh, probably probably 75 percent of your streams because what will happen is if i don't get all the way to the end of one of your streams and then you put out a new episode a news episode i'll just mm -hmm. switch straight onto that without finishing your stream you know so i haven't wow. heard everything so i don't know maybe you have mentioned it but uh i didn't know that yeah i and i bought this because i just i was like you know what i bought it on my kindle but i feel like this is a book i need to own like a physical book and I love the blue. Yeah, that's you know, cool, if you know, man. If you know anything about Dune, that's the color of the eyes when you, you know, when you eat food with the spice. It's kind of cool. It's kind of a theme and almost a theme in the book. But, I mean, it's just a beautiful, like, addition. I'll probably never read the physical book, but it's cool to own. And I love the the uh, artwork there, the blue eyes. It's just cool. But... The weird thing is, we don't know what the movie's going to be like, and where they say it's half the book. Um, right. I think I'd mentioned on one of the shows that the second half of the book is a weird... It, it's just weird, and you're, you feel like uh, almost like you're, you've lost your footing... I felt like it didn't, it took a while to ramp back up to feel like I knew what was going on. Um, I liked it. I wouldn't say that I loved it, but I liked it. That first, the first half though, I was in. So I think that the, 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 the Denis Villeneuve movie is going to be, it's going to be great. I just hope. So where is the book on the four star Robbie scale? The book as a whole. 
Yeah. I would give it I would give it a solid three out of four. And I would say that And are you going to read any of the sequels? And have you already started reading one of the sequels? No, I don't think so. At least not not right now. Because I feel like I need to give it time to breathe. And I'm probably by the time the movie comes out, I'll try to I'll pick it up again and see if I can get back into it. Because I right. feel like I went on this huge journey. I mean, it's a pretty, it's a thick book, you know. It's it's a big, it's a big boy, and all of the Dune books are crazy huge. Um, so there's a part of me that says, no, I won't read the sequels. But then there's another part of me that's kind of like, I kind of want to read the sequels because I kind of want to see what else happens. Yeah, I love I love it, and you can definitely see the elements of star wars that borrow from uh from dune um like the part with the wookie yeah yeah and the the force and the lightsabers and the sith and the jedi and the no none of that's him but you know what i mean it's 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 weird how it's you can just see these these little elements that you can tell lucas was inspired by this portion and then this portion kind of has a somewhat of a feeling, you know, almost like a family dynamic. It's it's good. But I think you have to be willing to say, okay, this is a classic science fiction book. It's been beloved for years. There's a reason why people really love it. There's a reason why there's, what, 20-something other books. I mean, it's ridiculous. And hey, what, so what have you moved on to reading since you finished that? Um, I said, I'm going to little, what do you call that? A shift in tone, a shift in the way that things work. Bruce Lee, the life. I'm reading that now. Nice one. I've yeah. heard that one, but, uh, that sounds fun. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a recent, it's a recent one that apparently the, the family was, uh, they approved of it and it, Again, it had been on my list for a while, and the, but I just I I like to try to. Um, I try to I like to try to mix things up a little bit, like there's a I mean I've got a list of books a mile long now. It's ridiculous. I keep because I keep putting off reading. Because yeah. I've been. I do the same thing. It's it's weird. Okay, I know that this might seem like one of those things where it's like like oh really this takes a lot of work to put together. Uh, let me tell you, I put a lot of effort and thought into Order 42. I may not have the view count to match the amount of effort I'm putting into it, but I want to put on a show that I like. So I'm my own biggest critic, which means I'm going to put a lot of thought and effort into the show, which means I don't have time, as much time as I would like, to catch up on show, old shows or movies or all that stuff and books because what happens is I end up catching up on you know somebody's stream you know I'm the kind of supporting you know my my friends and then I'm like oh crap I gotta go to bed I don't have time to re do any reading before I go to sleep all that kind of stuff so basically it took me a long time to get through this more because I was busy with other crap not that it was a hard read because it, it's actually a really really quick read um once i get going sure but i don't know i, I like to mix things up no, i'm the same I, man i, I like the to, same i have the goal of of getting at least 10 minutes of reading in at the end of each day and yeah i probably haven't picked up my current book uh for three weeks now at least yeah i it's mean like an, let me see so this is and I won't go into all the details, but this is my list, and this is current, of my books to read. And, yeah, that's a lot. And some of those are series of books. Like, um, and um, there's a, what is her name? Murphy J.K. Napier? Rowling. No, no. Murphy, Kardashian. No, Murphy Napier, I think. Is it Murphy Napier? I think I have her listed here. Yeah, Murphy Napier. Murphy Brown. No, she's a YouTube uh, YouTuber, I guess. And she does, what do they call them? Booktubers? 
you I don't know what they call them, but she does book reviews. And when I was trying to figure out if I wanted to read Dune, I ran across her review of Dune. And of all the people, you know how, okay, this is going to sound bad, but you know how like real big fanboys, they can really turn you off by getting so involved in the details that you go, okay, this doesn't sound like it's for me, right? Yeah. So I all a lot of the reviews of Dune on on the on YouTube were these guys that were so into Dune that it was almost like okay I need I need a I need a point of view of like you know a regular person you yeah. know and so I watched her review of Dune and was like wow I really like the way that she broke the the book down and non spoilery and all that kind of stuff and then I started every now and then I'll I'll watch one of her videos. And one of her videos was series that I really like. And so I watched that and almost all the series that she mentioned was like, I'm going to put that on my list. That sounds good. That sounds like it's something I'd really like. Like the, the one of the ones I, I bought was the, uh, the, um, the series. Discworld. Do what? Discworld. No. Um, it's called the gentleman bastards. And it's about huh. a group of thieves in like the 16, 1700s. And they're kind of a roguish group of people and they get into these adventures. But that's what they call the gentleman bastards. Hold on a second. I'm going to close my door real quick. Hold on. Sorry. How many doors do we even have in that room, Robbie? There's two doors behind you, and there's another door up to the side. This no. is the room of doors. Yeah, so that's the door to... This is an uh, an office in the front of the house. So that's the door to the hallway. That's my closet door. And then there are double doors here, like right next to the front door. And April just came home and she's trying to be quiet. And I'm like, okay, let me close the door so she can do what she needs to do. I don't bother her, but I had it open because she wasn't home. So I didn't realize she was going to be home so fast, but, uh, but yeah. So I would say I knew about the other two doors, but I didn't know about this. So now we all know about the other two side doors. Yeah. Sometimes I'll, uh, cause I'm used to you running off if there's like a delivery or something. And I always (laughs) figure you just shoot out the back door into the hall, but. Yeah, there's yeah, there's doors there. Yeah. But it's just it's It's good to have a lot of doors. Hey. You know what they say, when one door opens Then you could go two through in it. The bush. <laughs> it's just you know, remember, remember that was one of the things that we used to do on the on on switched on was the, the old uh mix up the the mores or whatever, the yep. mor- the morals. You know, how could I forget if one door opens, then you should walk through it. That sounds like a life lesson to me. (laughs) Sure does. But but, uh, anyway, no. Okay. So let me switch the, uh, the thing. Cause I know, um, I don't want to take up a whole lot of your day and we've got fights coming up too. So we should, uh, that's right. But in fact, I didn't even know who's fighting today. Who's the main event today? Uh, Paul Felder versus uh, Dos Anjos. So it should be interesting. Uh, yeah. There's never a dull Paul Felder fight. There's no such thing. I'm putting caution Mandalorian spoilers in the title. So here's your warning, guys. Um, if you don't want to hear us talk about the season the the last episode of the mandalorian that aired on friday which was yesterday here for for us be careful because we're gonna get into it i'll be careful for a few minutes you'll be dead yeah exactly so (laughs) oh be careful of the the clone wars episodes where if anybody was on a girder it was like oh be careful it's a weird thing it's a weird thing. Even when I'm playing, oh, I was doing the. Uh, that was that oh, was no. true. That was one of my favorite parts of our podcast. I was really thinking of uh, Doctor Evans. You'll be dead. Yeah. Right. Uh, There's two things not, that that I'll be careful always makes me respond with that. And something that you say often is, 
I feel like, and then you pause and I always say, feel like what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's like, a, you know, anytime that you, you know, my, my favorites was the, the old uh, pick up, pick, picking up an onion ring and go, look, sir, droids, <laughs> you know, and see how many yep. people give you that look of the, I'm like, what the? Oh, Pining Ben, 1974, enjoying your chat, first time watcher. Way to go, Ben. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you for watching. I, I appreciate it. So uh, Pining Ben, 1974, that sounds like someone called Ben born in 1974. And right. somehow, and I'm a Ben from 1974 also, 1974 vintage Ben. So from one 1974 Ben to another. Hey. Good to have you all aboard, Pining Ben. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't know who this is? Or is no. this you? Is is this one of those? Are you Obi Wan and Ben? Because I'm Bucho and Ben. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Like Obi Wan, I'm Ben and also Bucho, Bucho Kenobi. Oh, I wish Ben were here. <laughs> but let's do it. Let's get into some of this Mandalorian, uh, the heiress spoilers talk. Um. So yes. So here's that's your warning because here we go. Thank you for you know watching. What? You I just know. The, I just had a thought. My bro, I told my brother I was going to be doing this this morning, and he might have told uh, either my old man or my mum. So I wonder if that's one of them. Oh. Well, hey. Or it's an or there is another Ben from 1974 who's tuning in. I mean, that is an amazing coincidence if it's if it's true. It's it really is just amazing. But either way, I just. As long as you guys are okay with the spoilers, because here we go. But yeah. uh, you haven't seen the Mandalorian yet. Now's the time to tune out. Yeah, and if you do tune out, chapter eleven. Thank you for watching. I'm just saying because I, I just I don't want to ruin it for anybody because that's one of to me it's I know that there's there's a man lots of problems in the world, but for me it's one of my biggest pet peeves is when I'm watching a television show or whatever and they mention something that ruins something else so yeah i just i like to be really careful about that but here we go your guess is correct beachland's here i assume that's my old man oh. in which case if eagle foot is still there <laughs> they're both about that then both of our dads are on the line oh well that's awesome that is awesome i have to get my, I have to get my dad to send you a t-shirt like your old man sent me a t-shirt Hey, you know, you're really crossing the streams. <laughs> it's that is uh it is an honor to have you here, to have you here watching. Um, I hope I, you know, I hope I do your son justice. So there you go. But uh, so, yeah, um, let's just get into it. Bo-Katan. Holy crap. Holy crap. When yeah. she showed up. That's when I went, oh my God, because I thought it was going to, I knew it was going to happen, but I didn't know it was going to be so awesome. It's, it was shocking. It was shocking how good it was. Did you expect that it was going to be rubbish? Would you say rubbish? Yeah. <laughs> you didn't think, of, I, was, I was trying to think of a word that's not American, as not American as possible, like how Leon is in the on the chatter on the show and he's sitting, talking about sausages. He's such a sausage, you know, yeah. and it's such a non-American thing and yeah. rubbish is not an American thing, well, but um, well, you weren't expecting it to be expecting it to be so awesome. But the Mandalorian as a show has done a lot of awesome things. So I think they've got a good handle on how to, how to uh, give a character a fancy, spectacular entrance, right? I don't know. It's, I guess for me, I guess I just keep waiting for things to get bad. I know it's probably a defeatist attitude, but lately with Star Wars, that's what it f has felt like. And I, I keep, there's, there's a couple of things that went through my mind during the episode. And I couldn't tell them, I couldn't say them earlier because they're spoilery. But seeing this and seeing the way, the care that they are taking with, again, almost taking this character from this, sec this area or this era of Star Wars, and taking this one, and this one, and the, this this species of alien that we rarely see, the Quarren, and yeah. putting them all together, it's just 
there's something about it that's just it's beautiful it's beautiful the way it's done and it makes you go why didn't they do seven eight and nine because I feel like that kind of care is what you needed for this for the the end of the Skywalker saga, you know? Sure. And I mean, I know we've talked about it. You can't compare it to something it can never be, but you have to judge it on its own merits. And when you do and you go, "Yeah, I didn't like that." Then at that point, I think you're free to think about the possibilities. Um anyway, so, so were yeah. you a fan of putting aside that it's going back sort of towards the start of more close, more closer to the start of the episode to use the Queen's English, the way that the uh, Razor Crest entered the atmosphere, it sort of came down belly first, burning up like reentry. Yeah. Did you notice, do you know, you heard the director of the episode was? Yes. And yes, I saw there was a tweet that was released earlier today saying that there were shots lifted almost directly from Apollo 13. Yeah. And see, I like, like a Apollo tribute 13. to her father's, her father's movie. Yeah. Yeah. And Bryce I Dallas love... Howard for, for anyone who's still listening is Bryce right. Dallas Bryce Howard Dallas is Howard. Ron Howard's daughter and Ron Howard made Apollo 13. And there's the famous shot in Apollo 13, which of course is about Apollo 13, that uh, um, epic and amazing uh, self rescue mission where it comes down through the atmosphere in the bottom of a, uh, the uh, ship is on fire or, you know, it's not on fire, but the shot of uh, the razor crest coming through the atmosphere was very similar to that Apollo 13 shot. Oh yeah. So that was, if you're a nerd about uh, space Star Wars stuff and uh, real space stuff, that was a cool, that was a neat little nod. Oh yeah. And it's like, for me, I don't know the movie Apollo 13 so well that I would have picked up on the, the sort of borrowing of shots. But I remember as it was happening, I was thinking, man, that's really cool. And it's, we rarely see re-entries in Star Wars. You know, we've only seen yeah. one other one. And that was the, uh, what is it? The, can't remember the name of the ship, but it was in Grievous' ship three? in episode three, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this was really cool. So to the see. other thing, the other thing I, I loved about the episode, and this might be because I was, I've was i grown up on these islands and also because, I, you know, Jaws is my favorite movie, but I just love that a lot of the episode was basically set in a seaside, you know, like a seaside town on the docks. And the they go out on this boat, you know, this fishing boat. And it's so, even though it's aliens and what have you on the boat, I just thought it was fun to see how, uh, um, even in the Star Wars universe, there's these fishing villages and what have you. And I just thought that was a cool... Fun uh, setting, you know these uh, these old uh, sea dogs, squid men, and um, of course, uh, of course. So, uh, what's Admiral Ackbar? He's like Mon Calamari, right? Mm -hmm. Mon Calamari's and who are yeah, based on I fish loved as it. well, you know. Loved it. I, in fact, I was sitting there thinking about it when I haven't watched it again yet. I want to watch it again. Trust me, but I just, uh, I kept thinking. I I think that this might be my. It might be my favorite episode so far. What? Like, even season one. It was so... Again, I have to give it that moment. That moment when they drop in on the ship was such a... Like a holy crap... I, I What did I say? Oh my God. I think I went, oh my God. And it was just because it was the music kicked in. Everything was perfect. And it was, it gave me that moment, just like in the dark night, when the Joker comes around that guy and shoots with the shotgun. I love, it's those moments that the, what do you, I can't remember what I used to call them. It's something with a, an expletive, I'm sure. Um, but for me, it's, it's, it's that holy crap moment where you get that almost like you've, you've gone over a hill and your stomach drops and you're, right. you, it's that so much excitement. And that's what I got in this episode. When Bo Katan and the other two, they're not. What, what are what are they? What are they considered to be? Are they are they in a group? Do that is their group have name? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't know were, where things are at at that point. I don't know enough of the lore stuff. You're more of the lore guy than I am, so well, if you don't know. I don't know. Right, but she was a member. She was a member of Death Watch. You know, with Pre Vizsla back in sure. the Clone Wars. Right. 
she splits off and that's where i get foggy because i can't remember the the transition from her in clone wars at the end with the siege of mandalore because she's basically ready to take control but then sabine ends up with the dark saber in rebels so i'm like i can't remember how all that plays out you've actually seen rebels sooner more recently than I have. I can't remember how that plays out. And it's almost like I know there's going to be a YouTube video or a website that's going to break it down and say, hey, you want to know the history of Bo-Katan? Watch these episodes yeah, of sure. the Clone Wars and Rebels. They've got to do that. And I need it because I feel like I need a, a almost like a like a refresh, you know? But man, how did you like the um, scene when they something i didn't want to mention before because some people will even consider the fact that there are imperials in the episode a spoiler but yes the fact that the sort of heist scene is uh an imperial or ex-imperial ship so the stormtroopers globe but the best part is not the stormtroopers it's the <laughs> it's the uh two captains especially the main skipper of that transport ship um mm-hmm. uh, I don't know who that actor is, but I, I really enjoyed his performance and the two pilots as well. They're sort of looking at each other, these sort of two young guys, <laughs> unfortunate young guys. Um, I love that the dude was super tanned as well, which uh, made me think of sort of called back to the Marine uh, elements of the, even though he's a, he's a spaceship captain and not a ship captain, but you know, you think of, you know, ship captains as being very tanned. And so I like that as well. I just thought it was, it was a fun performance, a sort of a classic um, Imperial officer performance. Uh, uh, that was, so that was a lot of fun too. And the way that uh, he sort of went down and went out at the end. I yeah. especially love that shot when he has almost like a double take moment when the other, the uh, his second in command, I guess, says, we've trapped them in the cargo hold. Yeah. He says, okay, and there's this, You've trapped them where? And they cut to that shot of the doors opening and then the they will get sucked out or blown out into space. It was or out into the atmosphere. Yeah, that's uh I had to look up the his last name. I, I knew it was Titus, but it's Titus Welliver who plays uh he plays Bosch, the series Bosch, and then he okay. was also the man in black on Lost. Uh okay. in the later seasons, which I don't know if you ever got that far, but no. Yeah, I've but, been a uh, he, fan he of his, good. huh? No, but he was good. I, I just enjoy the way that they played these moments. It's all editing, right? It's cutting mm-hmm. from a look on a face to a to a an action beat, and it's all about editing pace. The way that they sell these jokes, you know, and the, it's sort of the yeah. slow zoom onto him going, "You've locked them where?" And it's basic. It's a basic pulp adventure story storytelling yeah this is not like high art per se but there is definitely an art to it and and i think they nailed the uh comedic moments yeah pretty well in the show i think favreau and and filoni i guess alongside them have a real good handler although bryce dallas howard right she's directing this episode so yeah but john favreau wrote it but we're talking about the filmmaking right it's the the edit so Mm -hmm. It's always one of those things with TV shows. A TV show director is not the same as a film director, right? They're really the owners of a TV show story are the showrunners, whereas the owner of a feature film story is the director. So right. how much credit you give Bryce Dallas Howard for, for that, I don't know. It does, and it doesn't really matter, but it was just, I'm just saying that was, I think they do a fun job of uh, selling those comedic moments in these shows. Yeah. And you have to, you have to give her a lot of credit, I would say, because last season. Okay, I will then. The episode with the ATSC. I have to. It was great. Right. Yeah. So. Right. But at the same time, you also have to realize that they're all working very closely together, you know. Um, but I mean. Then I do realize that if I have to. Yes. I have to realize that. Then I do. Yes. Well, it's just like you know when people say they can't wait. Yeah, you can. <laughs> You, you can, can and you will. You can I can't and you wait. will. You can and you will. <laughs> but it's, I love, I, man, there's so much about that episode that just, it works so well. It's the little nods to earlier Star Wars. And I'm not talking about Bo Katan. I'm talking about the Quarren and the, like yeah. you said, the Moncala, the, all of that stuff. It doesn't just, I mean, he didn't say something like, be careful. It could be a trap. 
You know? I mean, they could have done that. Right. They could have done that, but they didn't. You know? And there's there was a lot of restraint there. I didn't, honestly, I, as soon as it happened, I, I, in my head, I was like, I should have seen that coming. When he knocks baby, the, the child into the water. I should yeah. have when seen When you watch that it coming. the second time, it's super obvious. Like, oh, yeah. this guy. And even when he meets him in the bar and he says, I'll take you to them. And he goes, <laughs> and you go, oh, yeah. that's an evil laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't I pick that up the first time that he was going to be a bad guy? The only thing, I guess that's the only thing is that I'm a little irritated that I know this is, this is something no one cares about, but it's because I'm me and because I care. I'm a dork. See, there's a Star Wars quote for everything, Rami. I oh, care. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and if you're not a Star Wars fan, you don't even know that I care. Oh, yeah. There's a Star Wars quote. It's like the, um, that's impossible, even for a computer. Yeah. That doesn't or, sound like a Star Wars quote, but I use it all the time. As a, like, it's just fun. It's just dumb. It's dumb fun. Yeah. To employ these Star Wars quotes and uh, moments that right. pretty much entertain only me and you, of course, because you know what I'm talking I about. I love it. I love that stuff. But the Quarren. Why do they always got to be they well, they always got to be villains? Is there a good Quarren? I'm pretty sure there's got to be. It's racial profiling, right? It's I guess it's racial I'm, stereotyping. You know, we don't get into the politics here, but you know, this is a fictional world we're talking about. I just yeah. I just feel like there there needs to be there needs to be more representation of <laughs> some good <laughs> Okay, I'll stop. We'll, we'll stop people that. too. But it's it's just one of those things. I I I was a little irritated. That it was like, oh, again. So they're the bad guys again. Okay. Now I'm not saying that you know, like in the last episode, we need good spiders. But I'm just saying, it's. I don't know. I, I, I <laughs> that would have been and... funny if one of the spiders was good, and they're trying to find their way out of the out of that warren that of mazes, and then one spider comes around the corner and goes, "This way, this way." Yeah. <laughs> and he's like the spiders is helping them to go out yeah follow the good one but like <laughs> the that's one of the things i've always loved about lucas is that I'll, sometimes he will do that where especially if it's uh if it's uh the fauna in the episode or in the in whatever we're watching sometimes they appear to be very hostile and mean and whatever when really they're not you know like in episode one the the big the big almost eel looking thing that chases them outside of the cave on a second watch you realize that there are babies along the wall it's it's just a mom protecting her nest then it's even more tragic when the big the big thing clamps down on her or whatever you know what i mean and it's like okay yeah. it's nature right which what is kind of cool in this show it happens in this show too his the mud horn was just protecting its egg like you look at that right. episode from the other angle, they're raiding a, a, an innocent creature's nest, you know. And if you lo- if you follow the force, if you love the force like us, you yeah. supposed to like Master Yoda taught us, embrace nature, right? <laughs> they raided a mud horn's nest, and now every time you look at his arm, he's got that mud horn that's his signet. And it reminds you that the Mandalorian is an enemy of nature. <laughs> he's he's just a. He's an agent of chaos. Even the, in the um, previous, uh, the first episode with the um, Kray Dragon, there's even a line where the um, people in the village say, yeah, they, um, that Kray Dragon has been around these parts since long before this village was here. So it's mankind encroaching on nature. And who has to pay for it? The Kray Dragon. That's true. Who is the real villain is what I'm saying, Robbie. It's all about point of view, right? Who is the most dangerous creature in the universe? Is it man? Or rancors? <laughs> yeah, we haven't seen any rancors yet this season. Yeah. I mean, there's, time. We need, there's still time. I think we need some rancors. We need some huts. Look, there, there's, there's plenty that we could see, but I'm, that's one of the things that I love about it is that they have a really good way of introducing or reintroducing some species of old that we had seen before without getting, you know, the, hey, remember the thing with the thing when they did the thing? Yeah. 
Yeah, they're they're doing it very and it it works in the story, which is again, yeah. I love it. I love it. And they hit they hit just the right line between, like you were saying before about how the Mon Cala could have said something about a trap, it would have been too on the nose. Right. Whereas just right. like in all of Dave Filoni's and his other two shows, when they are coming into landing, Amanda says, "Almost there, almost there." Yeah. Like that you, does that's a Star Wars quote, but it's such a it's not one of the iconic quotes, so it doesn't feel on the nose. It doesn't draw attention to itself. Right. It's just a bit right. of fun, you know? Right. It's like I, how, and the other thing is that, I mean, not, there's no aliens in this that we haven't seen before, but one of the fun things about Star Wars that has set it apart from serious sci-fi, you know, the, that, that uh, reminds us that it has a sense of humor about itself, and we've talked about this many times, is how all of that, a lot of the aliens are based on creatures from, our world you know i mean there's the previous right. episode where what's her name the amy sadar's character is playing um is it sabak she's playing with basically an ant it's an alien but it's basically an ant right and here we've got the squid man and the man who looks like a shrimp and the of course this episode in the last episode the lady who's basically a frog or a salamander it's just fun how the <laughs> aliens right. not only they're puppets so it's almost like watching the Muppet show a lot of the times, especially with baby Yoda and the little baby frog. Yeah. <laughs> thing. It's just, it's complete Muppet show stuff, but it's so fun. And even baby Yoda himself, it feels like in this season, doing a lot more of the puppet um, baby Yoda and not even really hiding that it's a puppet. It's almost super yeah. obvious that it's a puppet. It doesn't matter. It's just fun. You know, it's all part of the fun that it doesn't yeah. look you know, like a, it doesn't look real. But yeah, it's Star Wars. It's not supposed to be. It's, this is not. This isn't it's hard sci-fi. It's a fairy tale. It's still good though. It's still. It's really, really well done. And I think what, especially what this episode did, I think why it was so like big for me, is the fact that you've got an animated character now into live action. I didn't realize how much that was going to mean to me. Yeah. Because like I said, I was almost on the verge of tears at some parts of the episode because I'm just like, I knew they were going to do it. I just didn't know it was going to be so good. Like, so is really... this the second time that's happened after Rogue One? With Saw? With Saw. I... Is this only the second time it's, that's happened? Where uh, an animated character has turned up in live action Star Wars? Well, I think so. But like Cobb Vanth... You know, from the first episode, you know, he was a character in Aftermath, one of the books that came out okay. before Force Awakens. So it's one of those things like they're literally... Wait, the sheriff, you mean? Huh? Timothy Oliphant, uh, the sheriff character? Yes. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, so they're literally taking from all pieces and all kinds of media, which is so different than what happened in Rise of Skywalker when they were just like, eh... He's like, uh, Poe actually joined the the resistance, you know, very yeah. early, and he he, you know, nah, he's a he's a smuggler. He's a sm. It well, wasn't that a lot like Han. Ah, he's a smuggler. You know, that's what they did. Yeah. They completely like, what are you doing? This has there. There's so much care involved in the way that they're they're doing this, and it all works together. And it's, it's like, you know what? If you're a fan of Star Wars, you're going to get it and you're going to enjoy it. And if you're not a fan of Star Wars, it's going to go over your head, in which case you're just going to enjoy what you're given. It's, it's great. It's really, really well done. But that's what I really want to hear. I want to hear from someone who isn't a huge Star Wars fan and they just watch the episode and, and watch it play out. Does it make sense? And you said that, that it does. You know? Yeah, like I said, I watch I watch them with my wife, and she is a, a fan. I mean, yeah. she sometimes uh, wants to do this when Baby Yoda's uh, in peril. But aside from that, yeah, she's a, she's a fan of the show. Yeah, but she doesn't. She has never watched any of the Clone Wars. She's never even watched the prequels yet. It's one of those things. That See, I've, that's great. That I've I'm... sort of um, that I haven't uh, subjected her to yet. I shouldn't say that. That's like old, old style uh, Bucho talking. You know, one day we'll watch them. But um, yeah, she's not a big into Star Wars at all, but she still enjoys the Mandalorian. And see, that's the thing that I think is really, I think it's a, it's a testament to how good, you know, how, I guess how good of a job they've done is that it can work for everybody. It's not just, it's not just a, you know, 
a little piece of cake for the Star Wars fans. It's a it's a piece of cake that everyone can enjoy. You know, it's cake with bacon on it. I mean, how can you? I'm, I don't know what I don't even know what I'm saying. Yeah, I always struggle with the food and allergies. You know me. You know how I complain about people talking about consuming content and what have you because I don't like the food and allergies. I think of these things as journeys more than anything. You know. Yeah. That's a journey that anyone can go on. But see, this here's one of the things that got. I mean, it really got my brain working. Is when I'm sitting there and I'm staring at Katie Sackhoff who did the voice of Bo-Katan in the cartoons, and we thought that's all it was going to be. And now she's here playing the part, and I'm sitting here going, what does this open up for other characters to show up in, you know? And I like started Darth thinking... Maul. Well, I was thinking about... Well, Darth Maul is one of them, but he's, he's already kind of existed. So I'm thinking beyond that. And I'm but they've already got Sam Witwer playing. Didn't Sam Witwer do his voice in um, Rogue One? Sam Witwer could, yeah. But I was Wait, thinking... Did, he, he did, though, didn't he, in Rogue One? Didn't Sam Witwer do the voice? Yes. Or am I... No, you're yeah. right. Uh, yeah, so that was Ray Park doing the actual acting, the on-camera stuff, but Sam Witwer did the voice, yes. But then, I was thinking even beyond that. I was thinking, Kenobi, what if we got a Satine flashback? With a on-camera Satine, what if we move on and we do some other things in other eras, you know? And I think about the one era that I feel is the most the existing era, right? Not you know the High Republic that they're doing the the book series on that's two hundred years before Phantom Menace. We don't know anything about that. I'm talking about existing from Episode One to Episode Nine. What era? has the most meat on it that hasn't been really gone for yet. And it's this era of the Mandalorian, but with yeah. Luke. It's those, that wilderness between the end of six and the start of seven, right? There's 20 years of Right. History. But with Luke, do you think that maybe they're waiting a little bit and they're going to do a Luke story in that series because here's, or in that, in that era, because it's the one era, it's the one piece where people are not, authors are not allowed to write a story about Luke between six and seven. I feel like they're okay. waiting to do something. This is just a theory. But I feel like they're waiting to do something with Luke in between six and seven. And I think they're waiting for a certain actor to be a little older to play that part. And you might say, well, what are you talking about? I'm talking about Sebastian Stan. I think they're waiting a little bit for Sebastian Stan to get a little older so that he can play an in-between six and seven Luke. I think it's an option. I yeah, I mean, but with the aging, you know how they de-age all of these um, characters now on Marvel and Star Wars? Like, they could just age him up. I don't know. Do they really have to wait? Yeah, they. I mean, well, that's the thing. They could do. Would they have to wait if that was their plan? Well, they they could just de-age. Are you talking about just de-aging Mark Hamill? No, I'm talking about up aging Sebastian, Sebastian Stan, Stan, which is well, easier than de-aging the reason. Anyway, right? Well, the reason I say that is because now, right now, he's playing the Winter Soldier. They're about to release their. their oh, Disney that's right. Plus. They've got their Marvel TV show. Right. There's so, so much going on. I can't keep track of any of this stuff until I listen to your show. <laughs> your shows where I get all the movie news and TV news. I can't keep track of all of it. See, like, I, like um, especially uh, lately, because I got, you know, this politics that you never talk about on your show. I basically have listened to every politics podcast I could find for the last month or so. So I've been completely out of the loop with yeah. any movie news and TV news. And I mean, not TV news. Yeah, TV show news, all of that. Entertainment news. I didn't even know there was a new ACDC album until, until yesterday. Right, and it's not it's not every day that ACDC drops a new album, so yeah, yeah, I've been out of the loop until I put it. That's why I need your show, man. When I put on the the Order Forty Two news news shows, that's where I find out all this stuff. That's I'm happy to do it. It's awesome. Um, I don't know. I just I guess I guess it's just because I'm I'm a dork and I love Star Wars and I love Luke, and it's the one era of Luke's life that really has no 
real there's there's so much missing there and i think one of the biggest criticisms for luke in the sequel trilogy is that he goes from where we see him in in episode six to where we find him in episode seven kind of at the end him he basically turns around but you know what you know what i'm saying there's that segment that we don't understand what he went through and we don't yeah. understand what got him to the decisions that he made, all that kind of stuff. We're just told those things. We're not shown these things. And I feel like this is an era where there's the only piece of content that we have from this era about Luke is in Battlefront 2, a video game in one level, where you find him on the search for Sith artifacts. That's all we know between Episode 6 and Episode 7. And I feel like we could get a lot, you know, I feel like there's, there's a lot of, one of the things that I want is I want him to be finding some of the truth about how it all went down. You know, like I'm not saying, Oh, he finds some, some prequel DVDs and he watches those and he's caught up. No, I'm just saying, right. I want him to understand it's, it's one thing to hear that he, that Darth Vader killed a bunch of Jedi. It's another thing to watch it, to experience it, to see that happen to friends of yours. That's why I, I, that's why I think that I've always said that Luke was young and stupid to think that he could, to think that Vader could be coerced from the dark side. He was young and well, this stupid. Is- this is something that came up on uh, um, was it a recent episode with you and where and I was just in the chat and we're yapping back and forth. Yeah. But the question of how much Luke knew about um, his father by episode six when he decided he he would go against um, what everyone else was saying. What everyone else was saying, you know, Yoda, Yoda and Ben Kenobi were saying you have to kill Vader. That's the only way we can win. And Luke was saying no, there's still good in him, etc. And the whole theme of that movie being to, you know, to embrace love instead of, you know, make love, not war, basically. It, it, when, if we're going to say um, make love, not in the, uh, you know, bedroom sense, but Luke leaned toward love, even though his masters were saying, you need to kill this guy. Right. But um, at that time, Luke had already been with the rebellion for what, four years or something. And so... Mm-hmm. In that time, even if he didn't know anything, he'd never heard of Darth Vader when um, Obi-Wan brought up Darth Vader in A New Hope, the fourth movie, which was actually the first movie, which was made in 1977, but it's the fourth episode. (laughs) Um, You know, in those four years, he had had four years to learn about all of the bad stuff that at least people like Leia and everyone in the rebellion knew about Vader's reign of terror in the galaxy. So he already knew Vader was this, you know, he's, he's like, uh, I guess Hitler's first Lieutenant, if you want to, you know, take that, um, right. you know, the story about stormtroopers to be a, an analogy with, with, uh, what Lucas was sort of hinting at by calling the bad guys stormtroopers, you know? And so Luke, even if he hadn't seen the parts that we see in the prequels, and even if no one knew that that Anakin had become that Darth Vader, um, he still knew that Vader was a terrible, terrible, terrible person, and he still believed that Vader, who was his father, could be brought back. And so that's where I come. That's why I understand the people. And well, like I say, well, I'm a defender of um, the Last Jedi much more than you know much more than I am an, an attacker, but I understand where the people are coming from who say he, Luke believed in a guy who had been, who had been tormenting and torturing the galaxy for 20 years or whatever. He believed that this guy could be rescued from the dark side, but he didn't believe that his own nephew who hadn't even done anything yet. He just had this vision of what could happen because always in motion, the future is. So it wasn't what was definitely going to happen. That's where that's where that comes from, right? There's well, an argument. Well, if this was in a court of law, it's not cut and dry either way, because I get where you come from as well. I'm just I'm just saying that I have sympathy for the you know, even if they're even if a lot of the haters are real dicks about it, 
I get where yeah. they're coming from, you know. Well, get, but here's uh, my, here's my something interesting though. This is and this is something that I've had I haven't really talked like especially like put it into words, but it's something that I've kind of had in the back of my head is that and I know that you hate you hate the idea of the force having a will. But maybe cuz I keep thinking why didn't Obi-Wan feel the good in him? Why didn't Yoda feel the good in him? Why did they think he's a lost cause? Maybe Luke was the only one that could feel the good in him because he was the only one to be able to turn him. Likewise, maybe Rey is the only one that can feel the good in Kylo Ren. And that Luke sure. thinks he's a lost cause. There's no way this kid is off the deep end there is nothing we could do he lights the lightsaber and then says crap i shouldn't do this and then oh he's awake crap uh by the way uh eagle ford says we have to leave when you really what's it eagle ford says we have to leave take care mr bucho and rob thank you for watching thank you for hanging out good day to you mr eagle for mr shepherd mr eagle for and thanks again for the t-shirt yes thank you Thank you for watching. I'll learn how to speak English again now. <laughs> what were you saying? Sorry. But uh, no, I was just saying we... the way that you described that scene, it's comedic when you look at it from a certain point of view. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to. Oh it's my God, I have to kill him. Oh, I better not kill him. Oh my God, he's awake. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of those things where I have to believe that the characters. Like, I don't think Obi Wan. I like a bad your guy. argument. I like the argument that you're saying, and it works as. A piece of plot calculus, if you want to. That's a um, well, but it does. It's not what's on screen, and it's not obvious, and that's why, again, like it's not the story that's being told. It's not the story that's being shown. It's a story that can be told, but it wasn't what was shown, per se. Um, and so I. That's is why I get why a lot of people who are looking at it from a character point of view rather than from a law or a you know a, a force law or. That, and going into the sort of minutiae uh, or the calculus, like what you just laid out, which I which I think works, but just taking it um, from what we know of Luke as a character, or we think we know of Luke as a character. Right. The thing that is inspiring about him is that he believes in other people. Luke does. Right? That's yes. the thing that we connect to, I think. Well, that well, I say we as if I'm speaking for every Star Wars fan, but that's why. The original trilogy is such a sort of revolutionary piece of storytelling because Luke chooses. Because ha- I mean, we've talked about this a million times, but how many blockbuster, how many heroes' journeys end with the hero throwing aside his weapon? Or at the end of every hero's journey, going way back, as the hero kills the monster, kills the bad guy, saves the galaxy that way, right? And what Luke doesn't do that at the end of Return of the Jedi, he throws aside his weapon. He chooses love, right? Which is a hippie, kind of a hippie idea. And, you know, George Lucas is a, you know, mostly we think about him think about him as having 50s sensibilities, you know, that American graffiti. He loves the uh, rock and roll era and the 50s era, but the, um, he also went through the uh, hippie era. And that's kind of a hippie idea, what Luke does at the end. He chooses love instead of uh, violence. Well, true. But I also think that it's one of the things that he was basically showing this idea that when you see it, it's different than hearing about it. Because when Obi-Wan is watching... Is it shown or is it told? Because you don't see what he sees. Right. I'm talking about... And we also know I'm, that I'm always, in about future, always in flux the future is. Okay. Right. But I'm, I'm talking about Obi-Wan watching the security tape right him anakin killing jedi and then yoda even putting us a, a period at the end by saying the boy you trained gone he is right right and when when luke sees what he sees we don't know what he sees but as i said i think i feel like he's experiencing what we've already known about kylo ren up to that point and it scares the hell out of him but he lights the lightsaber. I mean, I don't know, man. I don't I don't see that that's out of character for somebody who almost 
I'm going to go save my dad. Well, I'm going to turn your sister. You bastard. You know what I mean? It's like, right. you know what I mean? The, the he, only thing, the only thing that sends him over the edge is the fact that someone else he loves is threatened, right? Is what? The only so, thing that puts him over the edge to go back to violence is the fact that someone else he loves is threatened. Right. Someone he loves even more, right? Right. Which is but if sister. he's if he, in his vision when he's looking into Kylo Ren's mind, he sees Han get killed. He sees him about to shoot on Leia. Right. He sees those things in the future and always in flux the future is, right? So these aren't things that have happened. This isn't security footage. As there's the analogy with security footage. I doesn't get that. I, all, get I in fact I even mentioned that. But the thing is, in the moment, you might be like, uh, you know, and I'm not saying that he was able to sit there and go, well, no, let me, let me just think about what I just saw. You know, he's experiencing this stuff almost like security footage. I mean, he, he, Anakin acted on, on the idea that Padme might die. It's part of the reason why he made the turn is because he's acting on stuff that might not have happened. It's not out of the possibility that someone might, their emotions might get the better of them. And I'm not saying that Luke but, is, An but, but Anakin is, is defined as the guy who couldn't do what Luke did, right? That's why Luke is the hero to so many from that generation, because he was able to resist that urge, to resist that urge to violence. But he still and almost the, killed him. the dad. end of the... <laughs> right, but then he didn't, right? Right. And he didn't kill his his nephew either. In the end, he chose love. And in that moment, that's in a, in a storytelling sense, in a narrative sense, in the sense of an arc, that is a moment when the character levels up, right? Now he's moved past that. But that's not life. That's not urges. real life. But we're not talking about life. We're talking about storytelling and, right. and, and epic narratives, that. right? Right. And in, and, and in epic narratives, this is the moment when a character levels up. And now... He's moved past that flaw that he has in himself, that part of himself that jumps to violence when his emotions are triggered. Right, to get to the end credits. To 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 resolve his arc. This right. is pure storytelling, right? You're a story guy and a character guy. This is pure like story and character stuff. But I also am aware that what makes characters interesting is when they when you can see a flaw in a character that mirrors I don't know, something you might have gone through. And the fact that someone might make the same mistake, catch it and go, oh crap, I shouldn't do this. And then it's too late because he's already seen, you know, the, that Ben saw Luke do it, go through that moment of weakness. I'm fine with that. In fact, I sure, love that. A lot that. of people are as well. A lot of people are. Like one of the fun things about the, my, sort of, my sort of chat group is that half of the people are... I think more than half the people in that group are, are fans of The Last Jedi, but the ones that aren't are basically the ones are basically not because of the things that I'm bringing up where um, that's asking a lot of, of some people to go with a repeated, a repeat of the same um, floor, right? Or it's more, it's, it's sort of inelegant to have a character grow, complete an arc and then have to, repeat the arc and this is one of the reasons i wasn't a fan of what they did with han solo and right. the force awakens where it felt so much like it was pandering to nostalgia and so it was like the least creative thing you can do is to put han back to where he was and um right. new hope now he's he's not with Lair anymore he's just with chewy he's on the run he's a smuggler it's that, it's that, that repetition that feels lazy it feels creatively lazy to lean into that because that's what we loved about Han. And this is what made people fans of Han and a new hope, right? Let's repeat that instead of, I'm not saying a character that has a, cause Han has his own triumph throughout the original trilogy where he starts out as a character who's all out for himself, you know, him and Chewie, we don't need anyone else. We don't care anyone else as it go, as he goes through the original trilogy, he becomes a team player, becomes a guy who will sacrifice himself for others. For a, for a cause greater than himself. And so, but it's not that he can't have an, so his flaw that he's overcome in that story, it doesn't mean he's completely flawless beyond that point. So I'm not saying that he can't have another fall 
so that when we pick him up in the um in the sequel trilogy he has some other challenge to overcome and the same with luke there are so many other flaws so many more interesting things they could have done with him to have his fall be caused by some other flaw in his character and they even hinted it they even hinted it with the hubris the hubris right he talks about it himself that he part of his fall is because of hubris but by linking it back to him basically making the same mistake and going back to the same well but, if that had already gone me, through in the original trilogy that's where, where it doesn't connect for a lot of people you know? but i think that's my thing is that he made a mistake in a moment of emotion and i mean to me the idea that luke it's couldn't, the same thing that happened in the original trilogy like we've already seen that yeah but okay i'll put it to you this way i feel like i feel like feel the like idea what? Huh? I feel like the character going through something like that is in a weird way, almost like saying to a drug addict, he's like, oh, well, you never have to worry about drugs again. You've defeated drugs. You're, you, you've, you're, you're, you're sober now. Like you should yeah. have nothing to worry about. Alcoholics. Oh, you're, you're done drinking, drinking. Oh, well then you'll probably never have to worry about it again. You're good. And then, getting mad at them for for falling back into it it's one of those things the dark side is not something that can be defeated it can mess you up and especially in moments of very very high emotion you can fall right back into the dark side and that's what i love about that it's not as you said like and i know you this is not your maybe it is your your thoughts but i think a lot of people look at that as leveling up but that's not the way this works. It's not the way the force works. It's not the way the dark side works. The dark side is always there and always beating you down. And if you, and that's why when he makes that mistake and almost, you know, strikes down his his own his own blood. I believe it because I know what I I can imagine. I can see that he's seeing something that's awful. <laughs> And I can, and I get the idea that you might fall into that, but there you go. I'm sorry. Sure. That, that's how I look at it. I look at the dark side as like the, the, it's a, it's almost like a drug and that it can never be defeated. It's always there. I mean, I quit right. smoking, you know, six years ago, you might say, oh, you're still smoking. No, I'm vaping now. It's different. But there are times when I'm like, man kind of want a cigarette a regular old cigarette and then i ha and i've done that i've had one and i go oh that's awful but it's something that's always with you and i kind of almost look at the dark side and the light side as you know addiction and sobriety in a way sure and maybe and that's like just star because and of star my wars own... rhymes right so huh the fact that they keep going back to the same well is uh part of star wars right right but I don't know. Because it rhymes. I just, well, I just, I mean, and you should never compare something to, like, you know, something can never be, but it fit both what they did with Han and what they did with Luke felt like missed opportunities because of, because of that repetition, you know, because there are right. other flaws that the, you know, the dark side could have exploited. You know, I'm I not get saying it. that he defeated the dark side per se. I'm not saying that he, like I said, I'm not saying that he shouldn't have had another fall, but um, like one of the things that, that, holds back the um i mean like i said i'm a last jedi fan but one of the things that holds it back is how right at the end the character you know ray is on the sidelines the new the new heroes are sort of on the sidelines while luke who's the original trilogy hero does the heroic stuff and the same thing happens in the same thing happened in the force awakens you know where ha ray and Finn are literally spectators standing up on that walkway watching han and chewie be heroes again it's like, JJ, I know you love the original trilogy, but how about we let Ray and Finn be the heroes now? You know, Han has had his epic arc in the original trilogy. And, you know, what do we need to give him this basically the same arc again and literally sideline the new heroes instead of letting the new heroes be front and center? And the same thing happens at the end of The Last Jedi. Luke is the one that goes out to save the galaxy again while Ray is sort of somewhere on the sidelines and Poe and Finn are cowering in a cave. Like that's just, actually look, Ryan and, and JJ, 
I get that you love the OT. I love the OT. But that thing where you're playing with your OT figures again, let them be on the side supporting the new heroes. It's time for new heroes. It's not time to give lip service and say, now it's time for new heroes, but have the old heroes be the heroes. No, let Ray and, Ray and, and Finn shine. I don't know what it is because I think you've said this before, but for some reason it hit me harder this time that that makes a lot of sense as to why Sometimes people... Sometimes I make sense. I'll be a broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> but I mean, you know what I mean though? That, that that's part of the reason why a lot of people couldn't get behind Poe, Finn, and Ray is because they weren't allowed to give... Holy crap. That's really... That's well done. That was well done. I I I like. That. I don't even know. <laughs> once if in a I while, have... once in a while, I almost make sense. No, it made a lot of sense. It made so much sense that it made me go, "Holy crap!" Yes. And I guess I just never. Let's finish it's... the show now, Robbie. While I'm on a high. It's... Let's finish well, now before no. I say something stupid and ruin it. Well, no, we we probably need to go ahead and wrap up the show anyway. But no, I just like I said, I just want to give you kudos because that was that was good. I like that. I thought I'd said that at least three times to you before. So this really does show how much attention you. No, it's not that. It's just. <laughs> I'm kidding, there, man. It, it's one of those things where sometimes it's like when somebody said, you know, well, Qui Gon was going to be the parent or the dad, the father figure that Anakin never had, and when he's taken out of Episode One, that allows Palpatine to come in there and be that for Anakin, and it made right. me go. I mean, yeah, I've seen that movie for years. I never really put that together until Filoni brought it up in the gallery on that gallery episode. So it's, it's just one of those things that it's just the right thing that leads you down a path of thought that makes you go, Oh, Oh, wow. You know what I mean? So anyway, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, no worries, brother. Well, yeah, let's just wrap it up. Is there anything you want to say before we, uh, before we get out of here? No, that's it, man. Like uh, we got into this through the Mandalorian, and uh, the uh, like. Uh, here's here's one thing I'll ask you because I was talking before about how I'm not nitpicking. The scene where the, where um, Din Djarin, the Mandalorian, they're all taking cover. The ship's going down. Din Djarin pulls out his bombs. Right at that moment, the ship's going down, so gravity is sort of rolling down this way toward the stormtroopers. Instead of just rolling them down the hill and staying in cover, he runs out gets shot down, <laughs> jumps up at the last moment and throws them. Why didn't he just roll them from behind the cover? I don't but know. But like I said, these are the little things that I'm just leaving. Well, it's just over. like you've said before. I don't, want, uh, I don't many... want to nitpick these things, you know. It's more fun to watch them go out there and get blasted up. Yeah, but mini Clone Wars episodes where the clones are literally <laughs> standing cool back on to top the clones. of things. Why? It's like, Mandalorian's brave and he's tough. He's not always the smartest. But it's and like... that's what helps me relate to him. But he stands, they, they're standing on something that could be used for cover, but they're going to stand up and just stand straight up. It's like, just stand behind oh, the, the Clone cover. Wars. In the Clone Wars? Yeah. 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 That Clone, yeah. Uh, Clone Wars uh, cartoon, yeah, that's right. It's no, a yeah, I'm, I just thought it was a funny, a funny moment. Like, this is a sort of, this is sort of tweaked to make it, they need a moment of heroism. And so they, this is how they play it. But it's sort of a moment of um, unneeded heroism, or, or see what would have been more interesting is if he would have tripped and whoa, <laughs> and just and they yeah. flew. He accidentally lets the bombs roll out, right? Or even what would have been more fun is if he actually turned to run and escape. Was like, if this, I'm, I've had enough of this. As he turns to run, he trips and then his bombs roll out behind him and yeah. roll down the hill. Or he, and kill the as storm. he's it falling, his, it. you know, he's he's running and as he falls, he kicks them backwards. And they go through the That's, thing, and they're like, they're like, man, the this three turn around and go, great job. And then they notice that, wait, why are you facing that way? <laughs> why, <laughs> why are you, are you on the floor? The exit? <laughs> Just make him the accidental hero, like Jar Jar, right? Yeah, that's it. No, Jar Jar, Darth Jar Jar. Yeah, but man, thank you again for coming on. This was so much fun. I had a great no time. Worries, man. That is always and, fun. And uh, and yeah. I mean, of course, you're welcome at any time, and and maybe at some point we can get um another another person on here with us. We can complete this weird triumvirate of doom and regrets. 
I don't know what I'm saying. But no. Apparently the a... audio was screwy, so you might have to just chop this whole section off the uh, episode when we get I don't... to the end. That's the thing is I'm looking at it. I can't see because I was trying to figure it out. So I was checking some things while you were while you were talking, and I don't see a problem. But hey, that's live for you. Sometimes it happens, and it may just be that he's saying that the, that because he didn't mention what was screwy. It could be that you were delayed a little bit because with Zoom, that's one of the things that you just can't fix. The audio is going to be off from the from the from the video. Sure. Every time. And maybe that was it. But anyway, again, Bucho, thank you for being on. Thank you for watching because we had a great time today. I hope you guys did too. And we will see you Tuesday with some more gaming action. Not sure what we're going to do yet, but I'm sure it'll be fun. So, guys, thanks again. Have a good one. I'd really like to hear what you think, so please leave your comments below on what we talked about. And of course, consider hitting that subscribe button and give it a like if you enjoyed it. It really does help, and as always, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.